Good evening and welcome to the 325th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a, a weekly lecture series on <clears throat> comics, illustration, animation, and the history of all kinds of text and image work. This series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight uh, from Tokyo is Patrick W. Galbraith. Uh, Patrick is an associate professor in the School of International Communication at Senshu University in Tokyo. His recent publications include Otaku and the Struggle for Imagination in Japan, that's 2019, the Ethics of Affect, Lines and Life in a Tokyo Neighborhood from 2021. And he is the co-translator of Nagayama Kayaru's Erotic Comics in Japan, An Introduction to Iro Manga from 2020. His talk Tonight is entitled Erotic Comics in Japan, an introduction to Hero Manga. So take it away, Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you, Ben, for that uh, wonderful introduction and to everyone um, for coming out this evening. Uh, it's morning for me here in Tokyo, but I'll try to sort of match um, New York and just speak as if it's evening. <laughs> so good evening to you all. Um, it's my honor uh, to be here tonight uh, speaking to you from Senshi University uh, in Tokyo. Today I won't be speaking necessarily um, on part of the faculty or in my usual um, role here um, as a professor of international communications um, and law, things like this, but instead I'm going to be speaking as the co-translator of Nagayama Kaoru's uh, Erotic Comics in Japan introducing uh, that text to you. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here and we'll get started. Can everyone see that all right? Yes, at least I see it, yeah. Great. Okay, um, so yes, Erotic Comics in Japan. Um, this is a landmark text by um, Nagayama Kaoru, which follows on uh, Yonezawa Yoshihiro. Um, if you're familiar with the comic market, one of the founders of that uh, organization, it follows on Yonezawa's groundbreaking work, post-war uh, erotic comics in post-war Japan. And this particular work um, is unique in a lot of ways. And I'd like to introduce some of those to you uh, tonight. So here is um, our breakdown of the book. As you can see, it's relatively um, dense and, and quite um, exhaustive in many ways. It covers history, it covers different themes of erotic comics in Japan. It also covers a lot of the uh, political maneuvering around comics, which is something I think is we're feeling a lot. Um, if you're in the United States, you must have seen the news about um, Art Spiegelman and Mouse. This kind of maneuvering is quite common, um, even in the Japanese case. I think we have a, an image that comics in Japan are relatively unregulated. Um, I wish it were so. Um, it's not. Um, there's been a long struggle against regulation since the post-war, um, since the end of World War II. And erotic comics are really part of that story about expanding the horizons and boundaries of comics and really what we expect um, and you know, um, allow uh, for comics to do. So I wanna introduce this, uh, mostly going around part two. Uh, if you have questions about this, I'm happy to talk to you about each of the individual thematic clusters uh, that Nagayama identifies, but instead what I'd like to do is sort of three major things. So talking through part one, history, and part three, uh, which is the ad addition about the politics of erotic comics um, in Japan and in, in the world today. With that in mind, using the book as kind of a launching point, I'd like to talk to you about three things. One is the importance of understanding erotic comics for understanding visual culture in Japan, period. I'm talking comics, animation, games, all of it. There's a kind of missing matter, what one critic calls dark matter, in this whole physics of, of Japanese visual culture. We talk about it, but we never talk about 
this particular generator of new ideas, new talent, and just generally expanding the horizons of expressive art, uh, visual art in Japan, and then through the kind of globalization of that around the world. So first I'd like to talk about the importance of erotic comics in Japan, not just as a kind of oddity or a rarity, but instead as a central hub of creativity historically in Japan and Japanese visual culture domestically and internationally. Second, I'd like to talk about the ways in which what we usually think of as erotic comics is rather limited. Yes, there are um, very explicit um, adult comics for men, for women. It exists, right? All different themes, all different things like this. But one of Nagayama's real um, important uh, revolutions in this book was to say, well, no, actually, comics in Japan are erotic, period. And the reason why this happened is because of the evolution in which foundational artists were playing with erotics from the very beginning. Then they spread through the visual culture what he calls memes. And these memes spread across different visual you know, traditions, not just for, you know, men and women, adults, but also for children, for boys and girls, right, for minorities and the mainstream. It kind of spread into the sort of strata across gender and genre, across age boundaries to become a kind of defining feature in many ways um, of this visual form, beginning with the founding fathers. So names like Tezuko Samu, the god of manga, Mizaki Hayao, um, the one of the founders of Studio Ghibli, right? No one is actually outside of the frame of the erotic, according to Nagayama. And this spreads um, across different exchanges. So things you wouldn't expect to be included in this, children's comics, girls' comics, exchanges with Ban Bicine, exchanges with American comics, ex exchanges with American subcultural magazines. All of this actually is part of the evolution of what will become uh, Japanese visual culture through this kind of engine of erotic comics in Japan. And third, um, why we should talk about this now. So in other words, I'd like to finally um, hit on the note of the importance of um, the kind of freedom of what's called uh, freedom of imagination or freedom of creativity, sozo no jiu in Japanese. This particular concept that comes through um, organizations like the comic market that comes through dialogues with these artists who are producing erotic comics, they have probably the strongest ethics of uh, freedom of expression or what they call freedom of imagination of any group I've ever met. And this book does a really good job of explaining why they think that's significant. And I think in the world we're living in today, we would do well um, to not again, just hold up the, the works as kind of an oddity or a rarity but say, well, actually what they're saying is significant to all of us, even if we're not a reader of manga, we're not a reader of erotic manga and so on, okay? So let me begin uh, with an observation. We're living in a time of extreme concern about manga. And I do say extreme concern about manga, not just domestically, but internationally, probably even more so uh, internationally. We're seeing the word manga used um, to describe excuse me, an offensive form of comics. And I'll just come out and say it. And I'm not, you know, weeging this out of thin air. Here, for example, is a statement from the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, released in February 2016. And as you can see here, essentially their finding is that, um, quote, pornography, video games, and animation projects such as manga promote sexual violence against women and girls. You notice a couple things about this. Animation products do not equal manga. This is just incorrect, it's wrong. But this is in a statement from the United Nations. Now second, look at the way that this becomes pornography. Tote court, this is not actually erotic comics we're talking about. Manga in general becomes equivalent to pornography. And third, it becomes a violence against girls and women across the world. Therefore, it needs to be regulated. These kinds of statements, unfortunately, are not rare they're becoming more and more common, which is one of the reasons why we need to be thinking about, okay, wait a minute, what are we actually talking about when we talk about manga? And sometimes that means we need to get, dig a little bit deeper into some material that might, uh, that might be a little bit challenging 
for our uh, sensibilities. And again, it's becoming more and more um, kind of a parody of itself. You might have seen a couple of years back now, um, Australia became quite concerned with the flow of uh, imported erotic comics from Japan and began to be uh, sort of str strengthen their import policy. Again, it was more or less a symbolic move because the material is available online, very easily accessible through pirate sites. You, they're not stopping it by stopping the border, but they had this idea that they need to take a stance against this you know, offensive material uh, from Japan. And this kind of stance is increasingly common, especially in Commonwealth countries, so the UK, Australia, Canada, but not just there, in many other parts of the world as well. And what you'll notice is there's a slide. So the same senator in Australia who was concerned about erotic comics also picks up another comic. This one's called Ero Manga Sensei, which just means, you know, erotic comics um, artist. Funny enough, Ero Manga is in the title. But this particular work focuses on a brother and sister who uh, write uh, who write short, uh, novels together. She illustrates, he writes, and they become uh, kind of one of the greatest um, author duos uh, in Japan. It's also a romantic comedy uh, between these two characters. So pretty much par for the course for Japanese visual culture. You can see the image of the characters there. That's actually from the animation adaptation. But um, Senator Griff uh, saw this and said, uh, it's so, so terrible. It's so awful. I can't even describe what I'm seeing. It's just basically abuse material, he says. Um, that's interesting, because again, this is not even erotic manga. This is just general manga illustrations um, that you can find on any street corner in Tokyo, my neighborhood. Images like this um, are on cafes. They're on billboards. They're all over the place. So to say that all manga expression is kind of shading into abuse material is where we're headed with a lot of this. And eventually it becomes again so extreme that some people will look at an, analo an analysis of erotic comics, or erotic animation and say the analysis itself is offensive. The images in the analysis are themselves an endorsement of sexual violence. The most uh, probably extreme version of this discourse would be when Ohio in the United States, literally um, one of the lawmakers there accused um, Susan Napier, who's one of the, the you know, the great uh, voices of American anime, uh, anime studies, accused one of the chapters in her books on erotic animation of um, promoting sexual violence. And this kind of discourse is relatively common if it deals with anime, manga, imagery, and sex, it's just uh, off the table in a lot of uh, polite company for a lot of regulators, for a lot of critics. So you'll notice that these kinds of events, right, uh, 2020, 2020, these kinds of events were happening precisely at the moment when this book, Erotic Comics in Japan, was published by Amsterdam University Press. I couldn't have invented a better uh, scene upon which this was meant to be, you know, this was released. Because the book is intended to actually ask the question, well, what are we talking about when we talk about erotic comics? It's a translation of the expanded edition of Nagayama Kaoru's Eromanga Studies, which was released originally in 2006, expanded edition in 2014. Um, and the book is basically an, an intervention into this space. He was intending it actually for an intervention into the Japanese space, which was becoming more conservative at that time. But actually, the book works the same way um, on the international stage, which is a kind of um, chilling reminder of where we are. So when you begin to ask questions about what we're talking about when we talk about Eromanga, some really interesting stuff happens. So, for example, um, when the United Nations um, argued that we need to regulate um, violent sexual depictions of women in games because they're um, promoting violence, there was a response from actually someone that I know well, Yamada Kumiko, um, who said, well, wait a minute, um, you're wrong, you don't speak for us, and we answer your call for banning this material with, quote, an absolute no. So why would it be 
that Yamada says absolutely no to a proposal to, quote, ban the sale of manga and video games depicting sexual violence. This particular kind of idea shocked a lot of people. They thought they were doing kind of the, the righteous and liberal thing to protect you know, women and children in Japan. And in fact, we have a female creator um, uh, in Japan saying, but wait a minute, um, no, right? And the reason she said this is, quote, it's not a violation of any real person's human rights. And in fact, women are themselves producers and consumers of manga depicting sex, violence, and much more. And in fact, this is a source of creativity and outlet and a kind of revenue stream for women that should not be um, hindered in any way. In fact, that would be the violation of women's rights in Japan. So in a way, kind of completely shifting the expected response to the kind of common sense liberal uh, approach of the United Nations. And when you begin to ask questions again about things like Yamada's statement, interesting things come about. So if you look at industry surveys, this one's from 2003, the Japanese government, you can see here there's 291 manga magazines being published a week um, in Japan at the time. What you see here is the number of those magazines. Of course, always you see 8% is boys magazines, but those are always the biggest numbers, the highest circulation. We're talking million, seven million, that kind of circulation. They're always the most influential, but look at just the numbers. 40 girls comics, 55 ladies comics, 11 boys love, which is a genre of boy boy romance produced mostly by and for women. And 56 um, adult oriented uh, comics at that time. The number used to be much, much higher than this, which we'll talk about. But then you actually ask questions about who makes these comics. Mostly women do boys love, mostly women do ladies comics. Ladies comics are the kind of erotic version of, uh, of women's comics. In the adult oriented section, about 30% of those creators are women, right? So add those up, what you find is probably 50% or more of the erotic artists in Japan are actually women, which is exactly what Yamada is talking about. You're talking about this as if it were men foisting the images upon us. That's not what the scene looks like to me. It's not what the politics look like to me. So I find this to be um, a challenge to think about, well, what exactly do we expect from comics? What are the expectations about what they could and should be? Who are they for? What can they talk about? And I won't uh, dwell on this too much because I think it's a history that many of us are familiar with, but this kind of history in the United States of taking a very vibrant art form and due to you know, general fears of instability, fears of kind of corrupting the youth, fears of sexual deviance and things like this, this kind of general fear in the United States in the 1940s and 50s fueled a kind of um, witch hunt against popular media. I think what many of us forget is actually comics were the most popular media at this time. CNBC recently did a historical report on this. If you look at 1948, for example, 100 million comic books were purchased a month in the United States. That year, the population of the United States was 146 million people. You know what that means? The reach was greater than film. It was greater than radio. It was greater than television at the time. So no wonder regulators were interested in comics. It was mass culture. It was popular culture. It was culture that was reaching men, was reaching women, was reaching adults. And sure enough, it was reaching children. It was unsupervised. People could buy it cheaply. They could share it. They could trade it. So there wasn't supervision. There wasn't kind of control of thoughts or ideas. And this became a central kind of concern for people who were concerned about juvenile uh, delinquency or sexual deviancy, right? And so we have this kind of moment of famously comic book burnings that happen, right? And it wasn't just, of course, the sexy stuff, the horror comics. It was, as you can see from this news report, any objectionable comic, right, could be put to the flame. And it was done not by the force of the government. It was done by concerned citizens, Catholic schools, good schools, boarding schools. The children themselves were encouraged to be good boys and girls and put their own comics to the flame. And this began to kind of um, basically cascade 
with news reports from the Associated Press and so on and so forth. And it became a kind of cultural meme, right, to burn the comics and to, you know, set them to the, uh, to the pyre. This wasn't a long time ago, right? And uh, the kind of famous uh, conclusion to this, it's not the actual, you know, uh, statement. It was actually much earlier in the 1940s this was happening, but Wortham is probably the most famous advocate of this that essentially comics are a public health risk, right? So he says, we, 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 we regulate, you know, lead in the water or whatever. We should regulate comics in the bloodstream of youth. It's a similar issue. It's, it's a health issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a, it's a public welfare issue. Therefore, we should take care of it. This is very effective when he's speaking to um, parents and then later to politicians. The idea is you don't have to get into it too much. Some of them are actually more convincing than others. Like for example, that Superman is a fascist icon, especially in his original form. Um, people have talked about this, Chris Gavler and others. Uh, I don't think he's wrong here, but it veers into some very strange territory where essentially comics are responsible for all kinds of things, including for example, Wonder Woman making uh, you little girls gay, Batman making little boys gay. And again, it's based on some sort of evidence, though that evidence has been challenged over the years. But this kind of idea that this is the material in the hands of your young children, confusing them, introducing them to chaos, then um, naturally kind of leads to a call for order, right? So you have this kind of return to politics of the normal, of the kind of ordinary, with the United States sub, uh, Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency eventually bringing comics before, uh, before the panel. And this wasn't a trial or anything, though, his, though the media sort of made it appear as such. And because of that, you had these <coughs> terrifying panels that had been selected to show how bad comics were. So this is always a strategy. You take one panel, one image, put it onto a big board and say, look at this, right? Completely out of context. You can't even read, if you're familiar with comics, you can't actually read what's happening with one panel. That's the whole point. But you take it this way and then you make it a kind of, you know, a mise en or something to show to people that then allows you to do whatever, you, uh, whatever you'd like with that image. It's very powerful. Comics, again, are a powerful art form that affect, they appeal to us visually and imaginatively. So you can use that to stir up um, all kinds of concern, as famously happened with one of the senators called out, uh, William Gaines, for this particular cover of crime suspense stories in which you see a beheaded woman. It's just bad press, right? Having someone say, it's good taste for a horror comic or for a crime comic with this image plastered across pages uh, makes it quite hard for the uh, industry to do anything other than regulate itself, which is what happens. But famously, the regulation is quite, quite extreme. So things like, for example, you must depict people within positions of authority, the government, police officers, lawyers, you must present them um, as just and righteous. Um, they can't be, you know, good must triumph over evil in all cases. No vampires, uh, no ghouls, no zombies. I mean, think about our, our popular culture today without zombies or vampires, but in fact, they were banned in many ways from this, as was all kinds of sexual perversion, deviation, et cetera, et cetera, sexual abnormalities, violence, exaggeration of bodily forms. It's really the most extreme, um, one of the most extreme regulatory regimes in modern history. And so Scott McCloud is sort of in his you know, characteristic way has really made a nice turn of phrase to describe this. He says, to understand the impact of the code, imagine that movie producers were subjected to far more stringent requirements for, uh, for a film to receive a G rating, so all audiences, and there were no other acceptable ratings. Um, in fact, a lot of American children's cartoons, Fern Gully, um, wouldn't even be made, in fact, if this were the only uh, if, this, if this were the regulatory regime, let alone Scorsese or Lucas or any of the others, right? So this, in many ways, makes it difficult to do anything other than show righteous superheroes, funny um, t uh, talking animals, or funny superheroes, right? That particular kind of uh, moment of, of what has been called stunted growth historically. And of course, this isn't the whole story. There's other people pushing events to boundaries. We have underground comics in the 1960s and 70s with the countercultural movement. Basically, everything that's not in the, in the code can be done here. So no violence, no sex, no political satire, 
good triumphs over evil, all that stuff is inverted as a kind of like you know, fun land mirror uh, kind of situation we have here. Most famous of these people being, of course, Robert Crumb, uh, where many of his works shade into, if you're familiar with his work, um, there's a lot of pornographic elements uh, to his work. He's not the only one, um, but of course that would be what you would do. You would draw this kind of thing to expose the kind of taboo, the, uh, the thing that couldn't be spoken and so on and so forth, right? So there's a reason why Crumb was breaking boundaries because those were boundaries in the comics world and then more largely in uh, society. Um, so this is an interesting moment because we see the same kinds of elements that you see in Japanese comics, though that was actually a little bit earlier in the Japanese case. But maybe we can talk about this in the, in the question and answer section, but to my mind, um, this, kind of, this kind of creativity the crumb type of creativity, I don't think was ever actually integrated back into the mainstream. It's there, and there are hints of it, especially with independent publishers. But my sense is that it has never been fully integrated. In the case of Japanese comics, that's exactly what happened in a much earlier phase. And that changes, again, the expectations for what comics can do. And so I'd like to talk to you about specifically erotic comics um, from now. So first, an observation from one of the great, uh, the great voices of uh, manga history and translation, Frederick Schott, who said in 1983, so many decades ago now, he said, quote, uh, the general consensus among readers in Japan today seems to be that comics have as much to say about life as novels or films. That's interesting, right? Because right about this time, we have all of these individuals in the United States who are pushing, trying to make people realize that comics that can be equal to things like film, novels, theater, and so on. So that kind of idea that's taken for granted among general readers, that you can expect that from, uh, from comics is an interesting observation to happen in 1983. And the difference comes from a long history of pushing against and expanding expectations for what comics can and should be. And this is where Nagayama does a real service uh, to the field, because many of us know about the history of mainstream artists pushing those boundaries, starting with, of course, the person who wrote the foreword to Schott's book, Tezuka Osamu, The God of Manga. His kind of legacy of pushing the boundaries is well known. What has not been discussed is how Tezuka, in Nagayama's view, in fact, embedded in the DNA of post-war comics eroticism to be developed by later artists. This then sets a field that was already ready for the expansion beyond boundaries um, that have been set up for a long time in other parts of the world where comics still to some extent might be seen as art house, independent, underground, or mainstream for young people. That kind of binary isn't there um, in the Tezuka inspired world and part of the reason that that is so obvious today is because of the suffusion of eroticism into the entire field. The way Nagayama talks about this is this eroticism begins as a kind of taking up of what Tezuka wouldn't do or couldn't do explicitly, and then also a development of his own style into what's called bishoujo style erobanga. Those two trends happen, but in fact, those evolutions of the art form then create memes that spread out into all of the expressive art field. What that means is you have to look at the early phase of erotic comics, not as a deviation, but as an evolution, a particularly one that was set up from the beginning of the art form that wasn't stopped in this case. What that means is that all of the different magazines that existed in the 1970s and 80s, which is probably when we should focus most of our attention, when erotic comics were the most distinctly erotic, but also the most distinctly um, unbounded from other kinds of comics. We can see here that basically these magazines were incubators of, quote, idiosyncratic talent, as Schott himself has pointed out. Nagayama takes it further by showing which magazines produced which kinds of talents what kinds of lineages emerge from these incubators. So to kind of give you a sense of where we are at the end of it, 
But let's look at the most popular manga magazine in Japan today. This is Weekly Shonen Jump, which is actually produced, it's published right outside my door at Shueisha. It's kind of crazy, but Tokyo, the book district is like all the publishers are together. So I can, can see them over there. Um, but they're the best selling uh, weekly manga magazine in uh, in Japan and in the world, really. I mean, newspapers would 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 love to have these numbers. At the peak of circulation, um, they were circulating 6.5 million uh, a week. And then, of course, each magazine would be read by multiple uh, people, right, which gives you a sense of their reach. The estimated national readership was 18 million um, at its peak. Now, with the kind of shift to digital, it's a little bit different, but the numbers give us a sense of just how big it was and, and is um, in many ways. Now, look at some of the series that are published in here. I just picked three. Um, so, Food Wars, which was you know featured on NPR a couple of years ago, a well-known series that's all about gourmet cooking. But people tend to notice something about this. Why does eating look so erotic? Well, because it's literally food porn. Literally, that's what it is. It's a food educational manga mixed with pornographic art. That's what it is. The artist who uh, produced the illustrations, uh, I won't give his pen name, but the, the name he goes under for, um, for Food Wars is Saiki Shun. And Saiki Shun started his career as an adult manga artist, uh, making explicit sexual drawings, R18, as it's called here uh, in Tokyo. Um, so as you can see, even one of the most celebrated series now being, you know, animated and, and, you know, shown on Netflix is itself actually based in pornography. How about this one? Turavoru, uh, Turavoru, uh, which was serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump. The image you see on the right here, um, I wish I was pretending, but I'm not. That's actually from the manga that was serialized. Um, and you can see here, they're pushing the boundaries against just how far can you go pushing in a mainstream magazine, you see they're also, they're using naughty tentacles. Naughty tentacles <laughs> were invented by erotic comics, right? So they're actually, they're using the visual vocabulary that they know all the readers know, putting it into this kind of, you know, a little bit racy, sexy comic. And then that's in the mainstream, right? Yoramushi Pedal, a simple um, manga about uh, bicycle racing. In fact, Yoomushi Pedal is read mostly by women. There's a huge number of women who read Weekly Shonen Jump. Guess what they do with the characters? You can see here on the screen, uh, that boy with the green hair. He's looking a little bit close with that boy with the black hair, isn't he? Indeed, yes. So the readers of Weekly Shonen Jump, the readers of Yoomushi Pedal, take the main male characters and put them together and draw fan fiction about these characters, which is often um, erotic in nature. The characters become in a relationship that's romantic, sexual, and so on. To such an extent that if you go to the comic market, the largest market for fanzines um, in Tokyo and the world, what you'll find is the genre designation jump is actually almost synonymous with, for, with boy pairings by and for women. So in other words, the entire magazine is suffused with eroticism. It's steeped in it, right? So is it any wonder that the actual readers of this magazine, which is shown in supposed to be targeting boys, in fact, aren't boys, the majority are adults. There's men and women who read it, young and old. So why do they get those numbers? How do they get those great circulation numbers? Because everybody reads it, because everybody has some kind of eroticism there for them, or some material to draw on for their own erotic imagination. So Nakayama says essentially that things that were once part of the era manga world, right? So particular expressions, attractiveness of characters, things that were essentially limited to that space that really took it further than other people could are now opening into the mainstream. This begins in the 1990s when a kind of break happened. You had finally regulation, strict regulation being put onto publishers through their own self-regulation, kind of like with the 1950s example in the United States, they self-regulated to stop the government from regulating them further, right? When that happened, you split into explicit erotic comics, which are a minority, and then all the other eroticism just shifted into non-explicit mainstream works. So the 1990s are a space of 
just basically uh, explosion of eroticism in the magazines themselves, but then also in the mainstream. So eroticism, according to Nagayama, has spread thinly and broadly across the entire manga world. And this has been noted before by other authors, sociologist Sharon Kinsella uh, shot himself, but no one I think has ever really taken the time, especially in English publication, to trace those linkages. How did we go from children's comics in the post-war to children's comics today, right? So looking at the history of it, like so many, um, he begins with Tezuko Osamu. Um, it's a bit of an irreverent move, um, but Nagayama says we have to go back to the origins and the origins of the post-war form. Of course, comics existed long before um, in interaction with you know, Britain and the United States and so on. But after the war, after a period of intense kind of regulation of paper usage, but then also of thoughts where manga artists uh, were in fact tortured, imprisoned, forced to produce propaganda. After that particular moment in the post-war, there's an explosion of kind of new creativity, which is um, symbolized by the rise of Tezuko Osamu, who was not in the center of the country, Tokyo, but he was in kind of the, sec the secondary center, Osaka working basically doing a trashy, what's called red comics, which were so called because of the cheap paper they were printed on where the ink would, would run throughout the page. So they were kind of trashy, simple stories. You weren't paid much to do them, but you could do whatever you wanted in those comics. And Tezuka really flowered, um, flourished in this particular space. So you have um, a simple style done by Tezuka that becomes a hit because of his long form works, but also his introduction of ideas. Uh, he's a man who was raised on uh, global theater, global film, global literature. That then is something he's interested in. And when he has a chance to do whatever he wants in comics, this is what he does, right? There, he's still drawing for children, but he takes these ideas and puts them into his works which makes it uh, more interesting than anything else you can get for that price in the devastation after World War II. So you can get a sense of how, um, how successful he was in his first really big blockbuster work, um, New Treasure Island, which you see here, that was released in 1947, just two years after the end of World War II when, to when Tokyo and most of Japan was, was bombed to rubble. You can see his, uh, at his first comic um, in this particular blockbuster vein, sold as many as 800,000 copies, right? So which is a huge number, but look at that range, 400,000 to 800,000, why is this? Because we actually don't know how many were sold. Not only is it historical, but people were just copying it like mad, right? They were just stealing it. It's got a very simple style. So it's really easy to copy, reproduce, put out there. So we can't really get a, a sense, but what we can get a sense of is what it did. It inv invigorated an entire generation of people young people like the, the ones who would go on to create Doraemon and so on and so forth. These particular children read this comic and said, oh my God, comics are really interesting. It's, it's, it's fascinating, it's good material. It's like watching a film, it's like watching you know, moving pictures. And this then inspired a whole generation of readers and then a whole generation of followers, disciples and rivals. This is the Tezuka boom. He creates a simple visual language that can be easily learned, copied, to then produce your own stories. And he also takes it seriously enough that people come to him and want to challenge him. That creates this kind of engine of the explosion of post-war comics. It's not really as simple as, you know, Japanese love, you know, sequential art. I don't like that kind of culturalist explanation. I think it's quite lacking. In fact, all of the factors are together, history, politics, economics, all the things. Tezuka was in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. He had the, the ground to run, had the freedom to run, and that allowed comics to take off before the advent of television. Then he tied up with television and made the manga anime complex that is still what we have uh, to this day. So it really isn't as simple as Japanese like sequential art. Sequential art just became mass culture and was allowed to grow as such before any kind of competition and before regulation really took hold. So Tezuka um, is well known for his work for children, but I think what's less known is that he was always pushing boundaries. He himself always thought he was drawing for children in the early years. Let's not forget, he's 
He's not like some kind of radical subcultural creator. He thought he was doing it for children, but look at what he did. So this is a red comic from, called Age Old Gunfighter from 1949, which is basically his version of an American Western. But in that story, he has a Native American um, character called Monster kissing a white woman. Um, so he's actually literally showing an interracial kiss in 1949 in a comic for kids. This kind of pushing of boundaries made him actually in many ways controversial for parents. Parents thought he was with the enemy of children. It's unthinkable today. If you know anything about Tezuka, he's like the old man of, of, of comics. But at the time, he was considered to be quite radical in his pushing of those boundaries of what is acceptable for children. And in fact, there were people who thought comics were a bad influence. There was what's called the, you know, the, the, the getting rid of, of negative texts movement uh, run by PTAs, schools. They encouraged children to bring books to the schoolyard and burn them, right? Just like in the United States. The difference is it didn't stop anybody. In fact, people like Tessica pushed beyond um, that kind of you know, negative attention to become even more influential and their rivals went even further still. So if you look at just Tezuka's work, what Nagayama does so beautifully is as someone who grew up with this stuff, he just points out things that maybe have missed us, uh, especially if you're not a Japanese reader, we might not be familiar with this. But he says growing up, there were characters who were cross-dressing, there were characters who were androgynous, there were scenes of torture that was eroticized, there was all kinds of you know, cross-gender, cross-age eroticism, even cross-species with different kinds of plants and animals in erotic relationships. Before he even went into explicit stuff, these kids said, uh, Nagayama says, personally, I knew it was erotic growing up. Saito Tamaki, um, who's the famous um, psychiatrist who wrote Beautiful Fighting Girl, says he actually could not watch Tezuka's cartoons with his parents because it made him too aroused. Um, and so he had to go to his room. And so there's a kind of sense that I think we don't understand how influential this was to show a character that you know to be male then being shown in a way that's attractive, not as a kind of Bugs Bunny kind of joke, but in fact, literally an object of attraction and attention. And it goes beyond um, just, you know, his sort of smaller stuff like Captain Ken and, you know, the white pilot. It goes to other things like Princess Knight, one of the most influential um, early shoujo manga of the post-war period, which shows uh, basically what's called a pants girl, a girl who appears to be a boy, and many readers would think of her as such, but she also is a girl, right? She has two hearts. She's transgender, you might, you might want to say, but this particular character um, becomes an icon for uh, boys and also an object of, attra of attraction and attention. These memes then spread, right? Um, so I would like to also point out that, it, again, it isn't just the smaller stuff. Like you might be familiar with Tezuka's most famous work, Astro Boy, which is kind of one of the early um, Japanese superheroes. The thing about Astro Boy is the more you know about him, them, them, the more you know about them, the stranger it becomes. So Astro Boy is a little boy robot who fights for justice, right? Simple enough, yeah? Only, no, in fact, he was supposed to be, they were supposed to be female, and then the editor of the magazine said, no, no one's going to read that, make it a male. So he said, okay, fine, he's a boy, but he didn't change anything. <laughs> so Astro Boy has like big eyelashes and gigantic eyes and curvy hips. And he's, he strikes these kinds of sexy poses, like, you know. And in fact, if you follow the, the anime adaptations, Astro Boy's legs are in fact a female android's legs that are hidden beneath his boots. So like all of this stuff gives you this interesting idea that even the mainstream male superhero under Tezuka's hands is a really strange thing, right? And so uh, Nagayama talks about this as quote, po um, polymorphous perversity. You introduce all of this into the original image and it's there to be exploited by later people who pick up on it, right? And that's really the origin of what he calls Bishoujo style erotic comics. It's not the end of the story, but if you think about basically erotic comics in Japan today are Tezuka informed eroticism, what has been called cute eroticism, manga anime style eroticism. If you think about it that way, you're halfway there. That's one of the main things he's arguing here. The mainline children's comics mixed with the mainline girls comics 
created a hybrid form under subcultural hands that then spread all over to become things like Sailor Moon, which is an eroticized bishoujo character, right? This is essentially the kind of argument uh, that he's launching here. It wasn't just Tezuka, of course, and we don't wanna give him too much credit. I mean, he's been deified um, so many times, and the god of manga, the godfather of manga. He did inspire so many people, um, but others like Yokoyama Mitsuteru, um, who recently passed, are also important. So one of the, the image you see here, which is the cover of the book, is uh, Nakata Aki, a female artist who remembers in her, um, her pretty pink diary, she's remembering um, seeing a torture scene from uh, Yokoyama's uh, Kagemaru of Iga. She saw this in 1961 in a boys magazine. So already you can see the crossover girls reading boys magazines, but she saw this and also she was aroused by the image of Kagemaru's torture. And she later would go on to become an erotic manga artist herself. So it wasn't just Tezuka. You can see how this introduction into the mainstream influenced the entire next generation of creators. So sometimes called the spiritual successor of Tezuka in eroticism would be Nagai Go, uh, who's still alive um, to this day. They called him Gochan uh, back at the time because he was a young creator who was kind of speaking to the young audience with this kind of like, again, edgy erotic humor that was being serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump. Uh, again, let's point out a mainstream magazine in the late 60s and early 1970s. His work, such as Shameless School, uh, which shows characters, you know, being stripped down, skirts being thrown up, all kinds of violence. Basically, think about the worst things that could happen at school. It happens in this school. That's the joke. The school is out of control, uh, which is great for kids. They love it, right? So this particular thing also introduced his, his kind of fetish, which was a kind of playboy-like image in his girl characters, which would be shown topless. Now, that would, again, be exposing multiple different uh, readerships to a kind of eroticized female image in the manga anime style. And Go's, uh, Nagai Go's style is very much in the, te the Tezuka lineage. So much so that in 1970, his work, um, A Shameless School, was actually criticized for introducing uh, mainstream, you know, introducing eroticism into mainstream comics. That same year, though, Tezuka, uh, was branching out into eroticism with two different works, um, many others, but two that got um, sort of pinged by the regulators. One of them was Apollo's Song, which is a wonderful uh, story about basically this young man who's extremely mentally uh, disturbed, and he's trying to work through his sexual desires in a you know in a in a kind of way that is explicit because it's still in fantasy, but it's a kind of deep dive into sexual violence. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful story, very mature. But this was actually considered um, to be terrible because of the sex scene, it was banned in some places. The same year in Weekly Shonen Champion, um, he was doing another story called Yakipachi's Maria, which is more of a kind of fun story. It's just a, a boy who's sexually frustrated, um, releases ectoplasm, <laughs> you know, and that, in, that you know, invigorates this doll um, that then becomes his kind of partner, this beautiful Maria, who helps him through his sexual frustrations, which is, again, if you're familiar with the anime manga scene today, it's like, yes, I, I already understand that storyline. But at the time, in 1970, um, he was considered, his work was considered to be harmful uh, to children by even state welfare bodies. So this kind of pushing of those boundaries, especially sexual boundaries, was, was meeting resistance, but it was pushing into more and more mainstream places, even with people like Tessica. So here's an example on the left of um, Apollo's song, and on the right, um, that's Yakipachi's Maria. I won't show the more um, explicit images, but you get a sense of the kind of thing we're talking about. It's clearly Tessica's style. But it's a mature Tessica style. It's later in his career, and you can see that um, the images are clearly focusing on the body and focusing on the naked and eroticized female body. And here's an example of Nagai's work, and you can see he's much less uh, sort of chaste about it. Um, this is Nagai's work, uh, Violence Jack from 1973. You can get a sense, look at the, the body here. He's doing a manga anime style character, but a clear focus on a body that is physically present and eroticized, right? So a kind of physical body and a manga face, right? A cute face with an eroticized body. 
this is uh, in many ways one thing that made him very, very popular, his way of balancing between fiction and reality, between um, sort of jokes and eroticism. The second side of this, so the Tezuka evolution on the one side, the second side of this is the, um, the more adult, directly adult stuff, which was a kind of counter to Tezuka, what's called Gekiga. So Gekiga emerged from people in Osaka who kind of thought that Tezuka wasn't really taking it far enough. He wasn't filmic enough. He wasn't serious enough. He was aiming for a young audience. So they said, look, we're going to do film noir. We're going to do serious social stuff, satire and uh, politics and you know, social movements, crime, that kind of thing. We're also going to aim at an older audience. And we're also going to distribute it in libraries, rental libraries, which allow us to not have the same kinds of you know, restrictions that you would have with a magazine. So they pushed far, right? 1957, the word is coined. By 1959, we have uh, the son of a communist, uh, Shirato Sampe, doing his Ninja Bugecho, which is a uh, sort of ninja samurai action story. You can see here in the middle, uh, incredibly dynamic action lines and incredible violence. You can see one of the characters there has lost an arm. You see as she moves, um, the arm is being dis pushed out behind with a huge splash of blood, right? So Shirato's use of the brush to make splashes of blood um, electrified um, young audiences, uh, adult, adolescent audiences, and created a whole kind of generation of people who thought of comics as, you know, really interesting countercultural serious stuff. You know, people like his, his later creators, uh, his later characters like Kagemaru, no relation to Kagemaru uh, of Iga. But that character would become a kind of icon of the countercultural movement, of the student movement, and things like that. In 1964, the magazine uh, Gara was founded, and it kind of gives a space for these new creators to do a lot under the banner of, of Shirato, who sells magazines. All kinds of people can do their own interesting creative stuff um, in that magazine. So this is a kind of counter to Tezuka. So the wave of specialty magazines, and I'm sorry, it looks like the image has dropped here, is from a, a magazine called uh, Manga Erogenica. Um, but from the late 1970s, a new wave occurs in the kind of dying days of Gekiga, which were integrated into the mainstream by the early 1970s with sports manga and things like that. By the late 1970s, you have something called the third rate Gekiga, which is basically tr what people were calling trash Gekiga. But trash Gekiga, because it was trash, allowed people to do whatever they wanted in those pages, right? So from around 1977, you have a boom in new magazines that are introducing creators who are pushing boundaries, specifically sexual boundaries, in these magazines. And the third rate, uh, third rate Gekiga movement is the first real kind of explicitly sexual material being released on this scale in Japanese comics. So at the peak, there are around 80 magazines that are providing platforms for everything from, you know, straight sex, just, you know, straight up uh, sexualism, to surrealism, social satire, reportage, critique, everything you can imagine was being done in these pages. So some examples of this, um, this is the pornographic template, this is uh, Sakaki Kara Masaru, who's actually still in circulation today in a kind of revival mode. But at the time, his particular kind of unapologetic sexual image um, inspired a lot of people to draw in that way. So he became a kind of template for how you draw erotic comics. So third rate Gekiga became the default for explicit erotic uh, comics. But not just him, right? At the same time, we have critical, critically celebrated people like Ishii Takashi. You might know him from his work um, on pink films. But in fact, his work was originally in comic form. So for example, Angel Guts, which is what you see here. Angel Guts was re released around the same time in the same kind of magazine. What's interesting about this is Angel Guts and other works like this didn't really treat eroticism necessarily as the point. It was more like violence is part of the everyday and I'm just gonna talk about it. And sex is just happening there as part of that everyday violence to such an extent that in fact, he was considered to be a real intellectual, uh, a real intellectual darling, right? So you see here um, a magazine and a, a magazine that's by and for the kind of intellectual elite uh, 
describing uh, Ishii Takashi's work um, at this time. And if you know the names on that cover, those aren't manga critics. Those are like some of the biggest names in post-war criticism um, on that magazine. So this kind of work was on one side unapologetically trash, but also it allowed for the emergence of these unique voices, which is kind of the story of um, third wave Gekigan in a lot of, uh, third wave Gekigan in a lot of ways. So if you go back to kind of Nagayama's trajectory, his lineage that he's describing here, you see inside of these magazines really um, eccentric talent. So one of the ones he often likes to point out is Dirty Matsumoto. Dirty Matsumoto is a really interesting creator. He still produces to this day, not just in, 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 in magazines, but also he every year goes to the comic market and produces magazines that he sells you know, to individual buyers. Um, to sort of support his um, artistic career. But he had a kind of unique voice, right? So he was doing a unique art style, but things like he has an interest in leotards, ballet, things like that, um, uh, BDSM and hanging, things like that. So he had a particular image and voice, which was shocking, I think, for a lot of people to introduce to see in these magazines, which made him memorable. And as Nagayama talks about, if you're memorable, you're memeable, right? And the memes then spread throughout these different uh, later traditions. So at the, around that same time, we have the kind of vision of the comic market as another alternative sphere of productivity. So it starts in 1975 as a place for people to um, buy and sell basically coterie magazines. If you like this artist or you want to become an artist yourself, you might make a small thing of criticism or you might make your own comic and then you sell it to uh, people coming directly to the spot sales event. It starts pretty small, about 700 people. Um, the last one that was held before the COVID-19 lockdown was uh, closer to 700,000 people. So you can get a sense of how large it is, maybe twice the size of, of Comic-Con. And it's primarily for buying and selling Coterie magazines. Over the years, it's actually become more and more about parroting existing properties. I mentioned Yoomushi Petal in, in Weekly Shonen Jump. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. You take a character you like, you put it into a magazine, you do whatever you want with the character, often erotic, and then you sell it directly to fans to create this kind of alternative circuit. People come into this, you know, like Dirty Matsumoto, people come out of this, like Takahashi Rumiko. People are kind of going back and forth into this space, which creates a kind of gigantic base for new talent to rise up into the industry. But also, um, as Morikawa Kaichiro and others have pointed out, that base is fundamentally quite erotic um, and based on a kind of freedom of expression. The greater the base, the higher the, the, the zenith, as, as he says. And so you can see here some of the things that came out of this. So in the 1970s, we have female artists taking up eroticism themselves. So you have the move towards what's called boys love, taking boy characters because female characters for girls were, were kind of a taboo subject to show sex with them. So instead taking boy characters and allowing for the expansion of sexual expression is what happens in the early 1970s. By the end right, of the 1970s, you have Takimiya Keiko's The Song of Wind and Trees. You can see there on the left a panel from that. Uh, from that. It's definitely Tezuka's style in terms of the cuteness but it has the shoujo manga, of course, elements to it. And notice those are two men in bed together right there on the panel. It was extremely explicit, um, the work itself. It was also mainstream success from, the 1960, from 1976 all the way through uh, its run. We also had kind of uh, magazines, small run magazines like June, they were allowing people to draw their own boy's love and then learn how to draw boy's love from the creators who were teaching them that language. And that kind of goes into the comic market as the kind of June style, and then spreads more broadly until finally by the 1990s, we have a whole genre, a subgenre of comics called boys love as a commercial genre, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But an example of the, um, the, the kinds of uh, fanzines you might see in the 1970s, this is Rapori, uh, which was released in 1979. Just kind of a series, a, 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 a fanzine that takes beautiful boys and shows them in erotic situations. Um, so if you look down there, those are the percentages at the bottom of the slide, the percentages of people participating in the comic market. And you can see that um, the circles, the people who are, are selling, 
are primarily women, and even the participants are primarily women. It's closer now to 50-50 with, uh, with men today, but when the comic market does their longitudinal surveys, they found it's always, um, it's always majority women and it has been since the 1970s, which allows women to, again, have a space to create, share, sell, buy uh, into eroticism. So the specifics of Bishojo's style, era manga, are a kind of subcultural movement that moves from the late 70s into the early 1980s. So one of the important creators here would be Asuna Hideo, um, who passed away a few years ago, um, who's known for his science fiction, his absurdity, and also his kind of honest diaries where he would talk about his problems with alcoholism and, and so on and so forth. He's a wonderful artist. He was a wonderful artist, but he also in his early days was, was a madman. He was absolutely insane. And he would mix this kind of social satire with surrealism and just absurdity. And part of that for him was this taking of the world around him and translating it into manga reality. So his women, regardless of their age, began to look like this, be shoujo characters. So he took the Tezuka style body and took a shoujo of four girls manga style face, so round with large eyes, sparkles, things like this. He put them together and then took their clothes off, essentially. And that was a kind of, you know, again, a subcultural move that is very countercultural, but also it turns out a lot of people thought it was pretty hot. And that turns into a kind of movement uh, in the late part of uh, the 1970s into the 1980s. And just to give you a sense of how important um, this moment is, um, before his death, uh, Asma actually won the Tesco Osama Cultural Prize in 2006, which is the sort of highest of awards for his disappearance diary. So just like with Pink Films and Ishii Takashi, from this fertile ground rises all kinds of really interesting and unique talents um, who are being recognized now um, after death or, or, you know, or very soon before their death. But one of the benefits, I think, of talking about eroticism is we, we don't have to just look at his, his honest diaries later in life to see how, how controversial and how good he was. So, for example, the first Lolicon fanzine, which is called Sibel, was released in 1979 as basically a response to this, right? Seeing kind of what other people were doing, what girls were doing, women were doing. The idea was if they can do that with boy characters, we can do it with girl characters and it will allow us a kind of sense of freedom of our own imagination. So you see here um, Azuma's uh, contribution to the first Subel. He did it under a pen name, but there's no doubt that, that that's him. And you can see it's kind of an erotic take on Little Red Riding Hood um, done in the kind of manga anime style. Uh, with his own kind of subcultural sensibilities, he tends to undermine masculinity. So none of the characters actually are able to have sex with Little Red Riding Hood. They're all kind of like failed phalluses, if you will. In fact, the, the, the big, you know, the, the big bad wolf literally snaps its dick in half when it tries to have sex with Little Red Riding Hood. So he, he's always kind of undermining the eroticism in a kind of funny way. It's not clear if he ever really meant it to be taken seriously, but it was. At the comic market, people were lined up around the block to buy um, Sibel, so much so that it was one of the first and only times that men um, outnumbered women at the comic market for a short time. But if you look at the eroticism um, of his work, you can see that it's very far removed from Gekiga. So this is one of the big three, the big three magazines in the third wave. This is called Gekiga Alice. Gekiga Alice was always trying to sort of do a realism to the erotic images and to the body and so on. Look at what Ozma's doing. It's not that, it's anything but that. You can talk about one as a kind of Gekigo reality or realism, and the other is a manga anime style realism, right? Both erotic, but in very different ways, right? So the way Nagayama talks about this is you have a kind of Tezuka manga, a reversal or counter with Gekiga, and then a counter to the counter with the rise of Bishojo style arrow manga. So the kind of counter, the counter allows for all of that baggage that was already there in Tezuka's manga to be unpacked. And in fact, Azuma has said all he ever did or all he ever thought he did was take up what, what Tezuka was doing and just take it to his logical conclusion. But it wasn't just people like Ozma. So I mentioned Miyazaki Hayao, um, the sort of great uh, director of animation. 
his first animated film, where his directorial debut as an animated filmmaker was The Castle of Cagliostro um, in 1979. As you can see here, the, the, the story is about the master thief and his relationship with a young girl, uh, Princess Clarice. And this inspired a whole new wave of erotic comics called Clarice Magazine and so on. So this also introduces a kind of unexpected movement. I don't think Miyazaki himself meant for this to happen, but it's no doubt that he was part of this evolving manga anime eroticism at this, this turning point at that time. So much so, if you look at sort of mainstream um, central magazines in the field at that time, so Anime is probably the most famous. If you look at the um, February 1982 issue, you'll see that there's a, a, a talk about what was really big at the time and what they called the Lolicon boom was happening at that time, right? And as you can see there, the characters that are being introduced are, are, are Tezuka's characters, whether it be Clarice or Lana from uh, Future Boy Conan, he was very much kind of a fan favorite of this new generation of people responding to manga anime eroticism versus a more realistic style. It's not just him. So Takahashi Rumiko's famous Urisi Yatsura, which was a starting point for one of the great directors, Oshi Mamoru, um, who went on to do Ghost in the Shell. Uh, he actually got his, his debut as a director doing the anime adaptation of Takahashi's Urisi Yatsura. Urisi Yatsura is basically Azuma, only mainstream. It's the same stuff. It's sci-fi parody, absurdity, surrealism, erotic humor, and then you mix into it a kind of romantic narrative whereby the alien girl is being is, is chasing after this boy who won't have anything to do with her. So you have this kind of romantic narrative that drives the madness. But essentially what happens in the world of Arusi Yatsura is very close to what happens in Azuma's um, subcultural manga. But this was a mainstream phenomenon. When it became an animation, it became sort of like the fan favorite animation of the 1980s. It ran for almost um, half a decade all kinds of films, original video animation. And as you can see in this image, um, it really returns to a focus on Lum's body, Invader Lum's body. And there's, no, there's a reason for this. Um, the original manga is a kind of joke. You take a Gravia idol and you translate her into the manga. So Agnes Lum becomes Invader Lum, right? The foreigner who comes to Japan all the boys lust after her. So Takahashi in her typical way is kind of undermining, making fun of um, sort of the male gaze and men. But at the same time, there's a whole legion of people who became obsessed with this character and this kind of gravier way she looked running around in a bikini and go-go boots um, inspired a whole generation of followers. And this too was part of what's called the Lolicon boom. So February, 1982, episode 16 of the Rusi Yatsura series, which is, exactly when this magazine was published. You see some of the characters, a new character introduced specifically for the um, animation. This is um, a, a teacher who comes to the school. He's obsessed with Lum. And Chedi, this little um, kind of commentary guy who comes around this Buddhist monk, describes what he's talking about. So the guy says, my heart is bursting for, for Lum, I love her. And Chedi says, He's got the Lolita complex, the so-called Lolicon, right? So you can see that even an attraction to Lum would have been part of this larger discourse of an attraction to uh, manga anime characters, even if they look like a you know a bombastic um, you know babe uh, in, a, in a grab your pinup girl. There's many people um, who, are, who are part of this movement. So found one of the, the leaders of the comic market describes her his first love, the source of all kinds of memes, a sex symbol, a movie star, all of this stuff. Asuma Hiroki, the famous theorist, remembers himself going to the comic market and being overrun with images of Urisa Yatsura. He also uh, kind of calls it one of the origins of his idea of kind of the memeable elements of the um, of the manga uh, uh, anime world. Figurines, if you're familiar with that kind of very high quality figurine made of the, um, uh, based on anime manga uh, franchises. One of the first um, sort of big booms in creating female characters, the shoujo characters was images of Lum. So we have uh, sculptors talking about how, how they themselves were in, in love with Lum and they try to reproduce her in figurine form. 
they were competing uh, with their creations, which then spreads to image, spreads to love, the phenomenon in many ways. The United States is not apart from this. It's actually very much a part of this at the time. So Nagayama adds to this what's often left unstated, which is that not only was it a kind of uh, template for a harem or boy with lots of girls in love with him, it's not only that, it's also a very, very classic example of what happens in, in Eromanga ever since, where a girl from somewhere, from the sky, from heaven, from hell, from another planet, who cares, from the, you know, some girl from some other world comes into the life of this boy and loves him for no good reason, just adds sex and voila, you have erotic manga. So then from there, all you have to do is add new characters and the, the, the story naturally continues on and on and on in a kind of serialized short story form, which is one of the things that um, Takahashi really excelled at, stretching out that relationship, stretching it out, out the narrative. So if we're talking about Lum as an image of, of you know, sort of lolicon, then we have to sort of think about what it means, right? At this particular moment, the shoujo style ero manga is where we end up. But at this time period, people were talking about it in terms of lolicon as a general term for the whole thing, manga anime style eroticism. So Ozma talks about it as kind of roundness, cuteness. Other people talk about it as girlness, kind of shoujo style. Other people talk about it more specifically as a manga anime style um, desire that comes from being surrounded by manga and anime from a young age. That's Nagayama's position. It's also Saito Tamaki's position. Akagi Akira, uh, one of the first people to write about this, uh, goes a little bit further and says it's a desire for the two-dimensional manga anime images as opposed to something more real, the three-dimensional. So this particular kind of idea is what we're thinking about here. So think about you know, Asuma Hideo, thinking about Tezuka, thinking about Takashi Rumiko, that kind of image being the object of desire would be what we're describing as a fundamental turn um, in this, um, in erotic comics in Japan. Another thing that's really interesting about Nagayama's book is he doesn't stop at just kind of thinking about how Tezuka influenced this. He does something a little bit more um, subversive and perhaps scandalous, but it's also true. He points out that girls' comics were also a source of means for erotic comics. So essentially, there's a phenomenon of men reading girls' comics. Why were they doing this? Because they had romantic narratives, they had more beautiful heroines, and they also had the one thing that uh, erotic comics did not have at the time, which was cuteness. So they took these images and folded them into their new comics, so from shoujo to be shoujo, right? So you can see the crossover here. This is one artist um, who's real, well known at this particular part of the early 1980s. His name is Uchiyama Aki. You can see here one of his images. If you're familiar with manga style, you could, you could already get a sense that this is shoujo, but let me just show you something. Look at that. That's on the right. That's Mutsu Eko. Mutsu Eko is known for doing what's called otome chiku, girly manga. And look at those faces. It's clear that actually Uchiyama was copying Mutsueko in this image. It's a kind of parody image, but also you can see that it's an eroticized parody image. This kind of crossover between shoujo manga mainstream, Mutsueko and um, Lolicon, which Uchiyamaki was happening on a much larger scale. So for example, here's just another one. I could go on and on and, and uh, Nagayama does at great length. But here's another example, Yuzuki Hikaru, uh, was actually drawing for girls' comics, uh, Margaret, which is a, a very standard shoujo magazine, girls' magazine. He was drawing kind of racy comedies like My First Time in the 1970s. That's the top image there. Look at the bottom image. That's drawn for a boys' magazine, which is Weekly Young Jump, another jump series. As you can see, all he's done is just drawn the same style of character and taken her clothes off and made it more explicit. It's not surprising. He was a shoujo manga artist who just spiced it up for a male audience and created this kind of series that was, you know, quite well received as erotic comedy. And also when it was, the anime adaptation was released in the United States, it was identified as pure Japanese pornography um, at um, AnimeCon in 1991. So you can see how 
um, different audiences might receive it in different ways, but it's clear it's coming from his interactions with um, shoujo manga and then eroticism. So the first of the Lolicon magazines is uh, Lemon People, which was released in 1982, beginning of the year. Some people dated a little bit earlier. It was released in, the, in December, but the actual date of, on the cover is, is 82. Um, and this is the first one to really call itself a Lolicon comic magazine. And you can see here, um, there's Uchiyama Aki on the right. Um, there's Asma Hideo on the left. So you can see the kinds of artists who are being brought up into this um, at this time. This is Manga Buriko, which was the second big Lolicon magazine, essentially a challenge to Lemon people. What's interesting about this is, as you can see, when it started at the end of 1982, it actually was a retro Gekiga magazine. They were buying up old manuscripts of Gekiga and just repackaging them as classics, right? Also, they had stories from overseas, subcultural stuff, you know, the stories in Playboy, that kind of thing, and uh, graphic photography, semi-nude photography in the magazine. So it actually wasn't at all in the vein of something like this. The following year, however, it transforms from this to this. And this is when it becomes the central, one of the central organs of this new wave of eroticized shoujo, these shoujo characters. If you look inside, uh, look at the cover of some of the magazines later on in the year, you can see they're actually describing um, themselves as a two-dimensional idol magazine. And you can see the, look at the uh, face of the character, you can see clearly that um, the male uh, artists are adopting a more shoujo style to their anime idols. If you go inside, you can actually see um, people like Haya Sakamiki, who turns out to be a male art, um, artist, he's playing with the shoujo style, right? He's also playing with reality, right? Actually literally showing you, drawing the, um, the, the, the parts of the, uh, the film as he shows the character being introduced as an idol and so on. It's not always or necessarily sexual. As you can see here, it's just pho photographs of the shoujo character. It's also not always or necessarily uh, male. So if you look at the magazine, you find that a lot of really interesting artists, female artists got their start or made their break in this magazine. So for example, if you look at the left there, that's Nakata Aki, remember her? She's the one about, you know, Kagi, uh, Iga of Kagimaro, uh, Kagimaro of Iga. Right next to that, that's Shirakumi, uh, Shirakumi uh, Kurayumi. And then finally on the right, that's Okazaki Kyoko, one of the most famous of the new wave shoujo manga artists who did things like Helter Skelter, and so on that were pink, that were really a, a great dissection of you know, male desire and the male gaze and consumerism in, in, um, in Japanese society in the 1980s. Um, and she had a space in this magazine to sort of stretch and, 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 and challenge some of the boundaries of what was accepted in, in manga at the time. From this spins off the first adult animated series. So you have things like Lolita Anime, one and two, the first by um, Wonder Kids, the second by Nikatsu. And they're using the images, or the, the name of people like Uchiyama Aki. And then finally, uh, the Cream Lemon series, which is probably the most famous of all of them. But as you can see, it's really kind of taking that manga anime image, manga anime eroticism and running with it um, as a kind of central hub of their original video animation uh, catalog. Uh, recently, Jonathan Clements, um, the anime historian, has said something that I think is quite right, uh, and it's very close to what Nagayama is saying as well. He argues that, wait a minute, I mean, we talk about OVAs and adult animation as a kind of, you know, space of trying out horror or crime or that kind of thing with the direct market. People are buying it to see things that they can't see on television or see in, in theaters. He says, well, wait a minute, actually, that's the origin, yeah? So if that's the origin, if this kind of thing as the origin, we actually have to think about animation, adult animation in the 1980s and 90s with eroticism or pornography, not as the periphery, but as the core to which everything else has to find some sort of stylistic connection. If he's right, and I think he is in many ways, what you'll see is that this is one of the reasons why you can trace the rise of eroticism with particular studios. Like think about Gainax, the people who did Evangelion. Why do we have the eroticized images in Evangelion? Because they came up through this particular tradition, right? 
They start at fan markets in the early 1980s, producing the shoujo style characters as figurines, video cassettes, selling them. They then go into OVAs, selling their characters and things like Gunbuster. They do adult computer games, which are another market that kind of exploits the female character's body and eroticism. And all of that is folded into the eroticism of their work, even the mainstream ones like Evangelion. Now that's not to diminish the work. Evangelion is probably the most critically acclaimed animation ever produced in Japan. The point is it's not divorced from eroticism, quite the opposite. It's not a kind of bug that Asuka is eroticized in Evangelion, it's a feature. And it is actually always been that way, is what a lot of people are saying, not just Nagayama, but even Clements and others. So getting beyond this turning point, which is very important and it's a huge part of the history that Nagayama tells, you can sort of see a departure from just that focus on the, um, the sort of youthful looking Tezuka style body into something much more fuller. So he describes this as a return to the body and a return to the breasts. So if you look at the characters, the style of the characters, they might have a, a flatter chest in the late 70s, but by about the, uh, the time of uh, Watanabe Wataru and others, you have the kind of big breasted characters making a huge comeback and becoming the mainstream of erotic comics, which they are to this day. So you have a kind of manga anime style cute face, like the work you see on the, the left here. This is Thumping Heart Miss Minako. And this is, it's a kind of stereotypical image, exactly, because it's been reproduced so much, right? Other people um, begin to sort of use uh, the big breasts themselves a kind of expressive form as a kind of central feature, like Blue Eyes by Nishimaka Toru. And all of this stuff is part of, again, a return to the body and a focus on a mature form. And some stuff that was kind of left behind with Gekiga comes back. So, for example, Gekiga explored mature bodies early on, like, for example, older women, so-called Jukujo, but also mothers, other people's mothers, someone's wife, that kind of thing. And they often would draw them with ex ex exquisite realism. So, for example, the weight of the body, having a little bit more fat on the hips or whatever. And this thing gets folded into what had become the Bishojo style erotic manga, ero manga which then allows for a kind of return again to that body. So it picks up some of the Gekiga stuff in this kind of revival of the memes, right? This is very much what Nagayama is talking about with a kind of diversification across gender genre lines and also the kind of revival of memes, sometimes atavistically. So it might skip a generation and come back or a particular creator might carry it and then it comes back when their works are republished and so on and so forth. But by this point, it doesn't make sense anymore to call it Lolicon manga. Um, it was all called it at this point. But if you come to this point, it makes more sense to call it as Nagayama does, Bishojo style ero manga, to sort of make a distinction between ero, uh, a Lolicon as a distinct subgenre of erotic comics focusing specifically on age. It does exist, again, as he talks about at length in the thematic chapters. But that is in many ways separate from this earlier phase of essentially Tezuka style manga anime eroticism. So women are also a big part of this story that I think I want to end, uh, end up here with you uh, end before we talk a little bit about regulation. But in the 1980s, women come roaring back, not just from the bump of um, boys love and the bump in fanzines, but also with the rise of ladies comics. So ladies comics were explicit comics that were taking shoujo manga and just pushing it into the realm of the erotic. So actual female bodies drawn by women for women. And these could be involved in very explicit sexual relationships. So these ladies comics magazines go from two in 1980 to 50 by the end of the decade. So actually an explosion of these magazines. As you go into the 90s, they get more and more explicit sexually, so much so that they're actually on par with even the most, um, you know, the most outrageous of erotic manga, ero manga, and they were separated by, you know, many critics from Jose manga, women's manga, as a way to create a distinction between uh, the two categories. But this places it, this makes it so you have in place all the skills necessary for a crossover, which happens in the 1990s, a massive influx of female creators from boys' love, from ladies' comics into mainstream ero manga, that 30% I talked about. 
that group comes in the 1990s. And what they bring with them is all of the things that hadn't been there before. Eroticized male bodies, cute boys, male-male relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things that are now taken for granted. Like if you're familiar with erotic comics uh, in Japan today, all of those gender boundaries, male, female, in a relationship, the sort of you know old standard, um, every other book is some deviation from that, where you know you might have brother brother, father brother, um, you know male male relationships, et cetera, et cetera, boy dressed as girl, girl dressed as boy, all kinds of things like this, which comes from the crossover in many ways. We have also that kind of last push of creativity with people like uh, Moriyama To. Um, who was well known for his work like Sexual Education of a Good Kid. He was uh, given a space in the famous comic Penguin Club in the 1980s. And his kind of satirical take on society, his politics and his you know, takedown of economics and the treatment of people like objects and so on made him a really unique voice that later he would explore in works like Red that were really looking back at the politics of the uh, of Japan in, in the post-war period. And those works actually won him uh, awards and accolades later on in his life. At the same time, he's constantly being uh, slapped down uh, for violations of one regulation or another, which sort of shows you how those regulations that had not existed in the 80s are becoming much, much more uh, prominent as we enter the 1990s when an adult only versus a kind of mainstream uh, distinction becomes really, really clear. And that happens with the harmful manga movement, where essentially PTA groups, religious groups, all these people come together to first actually go against violence. So for example, the violence in Dragon Ball, they said was teaching kids to be violent on the schoolyard, that sort of thing. But this actually spreads from small rural communities, like in Wakayama Prefecture, it spreads from that into a more mainstream movement um, that's against any kind of, uh, of you know, violent sexual material in comics, it's going to be uh, bad, it's going to influence the uh, development of young people. And they actually were quite successful in lobbying politicians, getting new regulations in place, arrests were made of fanzine creators, of booksellers and things like this. Um, so this is the kind of moment what would be equivalent to the 1950s moment we talked about earlier in the United States. And the result is similar you have this kind of new gaze being put onto comics, things that I think today we might think are almost um, unbelievable, but there were boxes, what's called a, you know, shiro po, uh, shiroi posto, the, that was literally a box that you would put into it any comic that you thought was inappropriate anonymously. And the police would come by and then pick it up and then investigate. So essentially it was a tattletale system um, that existed in a lot of rural areas. Um, and as you can see, this, the, the kind of things that they were talking about is put in here if you, any work that you don't think a young person should see. Slogans like, um, don't read it, don't sell it, don't let people read it. Uh, be a good friend, be a good, be a good uh, family, be a good society. These really, <laughs> these really kind of creepy uh, slogans were, were being passed around at this time. And artists like Kamimura Sumiko, uh, another female artist who did the one you can see there, Abunai Runa Sensei, which um, is very much in the tradition of, uh, you know, th thumping heart Miss Minako Sensei, right? But you can see here that for whatever reason, she got picked up as an example of, um, of how bad comics were becoming. She got dragged across the coals in the public, um, so much so that her work um, has to have what's now called the uh, comics, the adult comics mark. And she's not the only one, but she was made a public spectacle of as an example of uh, boundaries that should not be should not be crossed. So eventually the industry did do policing um, and basically they agreed to do a couple things. Uh, mark their books that were explicit with the adult comics mark, put them into different sections of the stores. And in some cases uh, you, might, you might have to wrap them or seal them. Um, and of course you have to be careful about obscenity, which in the Japanese case is um, essentially showing too much genitals, whether it be male or female. The case history has led us to that uh, conclusion. So this then is their conclusion. We're gonna mark it, we're gonna zone it, we're not gonna break the law, that's it. So what you'll notice about this is actually none of that, except for the blurring of genitals, has anything to do with content, nothing, right? 
So you can actually draw whatever you want as long as it's properly marked and zoned. There's no regulation of any kind of relationship, no matter how uh, you know, scandalous or subversive or even downright disgusting. None of those things are regulated in this code. In fact, they're encouraged because now it's for adults. You can do whatever you want. And what happened actually was a kind of counter to what had been anticipated. Now that they were marked as adult, the artists were free to do whatever they wanted. So what happened was as mainstream eroticism spread off into just general things like Shonen Jump and what have you, the people left in these adult magazines said, all right, we're gonna amp up the eroticism. We're really gonna push through uh, the boundaries and make super erotic material. So you have the stuff we're more familiar with today as erotic comics, which really pushes the erotic eroticism in a way that early eroticism, like the stuff in Manga Budico, would never have done. And it pushes it because now you're allowed to do that. And so a bubble occurs, more creators, more magazines, more hard radical eroticism at this time, people buying it up like hotcakes because they're, because they're not sure if the magazines are gonna be there next week. So this then allows them to um, do brisk business throughout the 1990s. So some examples of the stylistic evolution that happened at this time, if you look at the left here, this is what's called neo-gekiga or what um, Nagayama calls neo-gekiga, which is a conscious mixture of the realism and the hardness and the action lines, the dynamism of the drawing. You're mixing that with a clearly manga anime style, specifically heroine, almost always the heroine is manga anime style. So you'll see here the way the character, uh, the female character looks in contrast to the male character who looks quite grotesque and much more realistic. And you can see also the look of the uh, speed lines and dynamism of those. On the right, you can see things like what Nagayama calls multi-screen Baroque. So multi-screen Baroque is a new expressive uh, evolution where you take um, the what you might call the camera and you put it into multiple places in a particular moment or scene to explode time. So what happens in the work is you're going straight narrative, usual movement between the panels that we're all familiar with, but because they want to show more in a scene in these more explicit uh, comics in the 90s, what they do is they explode it. So as you can see here, multiple angles, multiple characters, multiple scenes on the same page with very little movement, right? It's all just showing you different parts of that scene and that movement, uh, that moment. So he calls this multi-screen Baroque. We also have the, uh, the introduction of game uh, style characters. So think about the kind of ornate costumes and look of, uh, of game characters that gets folded into this. You also have what's called gravier comics, which are a kind of way of focusing on a full body image of the female character. This is coming from fanzines, where basically the idea was you want to, uh, for fanzines, quickly be able to scan through the pages, see if it's what you wanna buy, then pick it up, right? That particular style of showing that the, the female characters became mainstream at this time as well, et cetera, et cetera. I'll stop there, but there's a ton of these um, evolutions happening. Female artists are coming in, as I mentioned, from the boys love uh, boom that happens in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, where we had huge growth in magazines, the mainstream market for the, the, the comics is established, where we had 12 comic magazines um, being published at this time, with circulations of about 8 million uh, uh, at, at that time, 30 trade paperbacks a month. So a huge growth of erotic comics by and for women focusing on male bodies. Remember, we also had ladies comics reaching a new phase of eroticism at this point. And this then allows for a huge crossover at this time. So some artists like this would be available. Kura, uh, Kudara Naizo, uh, Unite Soji, uh, Yonikura Kengo. Again, the names don't sound particularly uh, female, and that's kind of the point. Um, often the female artists won't act, actually advertise that they're female, but they're able to then cross over and make these kinds of images, as you can see here, cute boy characters, uh, sameness of characters, which is close to the boys love dynamic, and so on and so forth. Finally, regulation. So we end up with a kind of hard line against how far you can go. 
So there actually is at this time a reaction against the extremeness of the erotic comics, where um, this book here by Beauty Hare called Mishitsu, Mishitsu was uh, charged with obscenity, um, basically for showing too much of the genitals and being too realistic. But it was picked up in the usual way. Um, a father saw his son reading it, put it into the, uh, the mail, sent it to his, um, his congressman and said, hey, look, this is on the street, do something about it. Slipped to the police, the police said, yeah, this is bad. This was taken to court in a very unusual uh, case. Instead of just uh, uh, development, instead of just paying the fine, as most publishers do, they challenged it. They challenged it twice. They went all the way to the Supreme Court of Japan, but it was found guilty um, in all three uh, trials. And there was a huge fine, and this book is actually banned um, in Japan today. So the artist actually admitted um, on the stand that he was just trying to make it as realistic and erotic as he could because that's his job and that's how that's what sells books. But there is a kind of, again, understanding that they could at any moment pick up a book and say that's too much and then, you know, find people. It's a kind of cat and mouse game where the publishers will push as far as they can. Sometimes the, um, the blurring of the genitals is basically nothing, like a little white bar over part of it. But the reason they can do that is because they're not getting caught. If, when they do, then suddenly everybody in the industry covers all the genitals with a giant white box for a couple months. Then they can kind of sort of push back and try a little bit more. So it's a kind of cat and mouse game. This is actually no regulation for how much of the genitals can be exposed, to what extent, and so on. That's one of the ways the law gets involved um, in the production. So you have this kind of clear mark of censorship on the works in a very... Um, uh, interesting way and that encourages all kinds of other evolutions in the um, art form. And the last part of Nagayama's book is discussing um, a new kind of regulatory zeal that happens around the revision of laws about the healthy development of youth. So basically the idea that Wortham uh, floated way back in the 1950s that comics can contribute to a harmful environment or be an environmental hazard. So this kind of thing is um, being pursued by local governments in a kind of ordinance way, a piecemeal way, where they're basically giving powers to particular panels to then select books that they think are um, unhealthy for the development of youth. And then they name those books. If then a book gets named or a publisher or their, their publication gets named a couple of times, it then has to be put into the adult sections, can no longer be sold that kind of thing. So there are consequences to this, but basically it's a way for them to point out things that they find unhealthy and then cow the uh, publishers into um, taking it off the shelves or publishing less extreme stuff. And this kind of entered into the public eye when uh, Ishihara Shintaro, the former governor of Tokyo, who just died um, a few days, uh, like last week, I believe, um, he, one of his last acts in office was to push through this revision of the, the Healthy Youth Ordinance in Tokyo that would allow um, comics and cartoons and games to also be named as unhealthy. What's interesting about this is, you know, in his entire career as a kind of bombastic, um, really um, populist uh, politician, also a bit of a, a, lug, a lughead and a racist, but he almost always got his stuff, his policies through without much resistance. But on this, he actually re, uh, was met with a huge wall of resistance from artists, activists, other politicians, free speech activists, um, all of these people came together to push against the regulation of comics in this way. While it originally stopped him, he then pushed it through at the end of the year um, in 2010. It's now actually on the books. What's interesting is that even though this kind of thing is done without much you know, discussion in other parts of the world, even just the zoning regime, a change in the zoning regime was, was fiercely debated in Japan, which gives you a sense of how, uh, how much people are, are devoted to freedom of expression in the comics world here. And so here's Ishihara talking about his rationale when he was pushed on this, but essentially his idea is there's messed up people in the world and we can't let them have these comics. Again, pretty par for the course for a guy like this, but it gave people the impression, um, as, and Nagayama shares the impression, that it was a power grab by conservatives to say that what was acceptable and unacceptable, healthy and, unex and un un unhealthy, control that development and control uh, what was considered to be a good and, and desirable society. And this kind of flippant way of, 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 of talking about 
messed up people made a lot of people concerned, especially when you're talking about the imagination as reflected in comics and cartoons. And there was an interesting kind of thing that happened, which is a regulatory slide, because they didn't really have an idea of what was the problem. So when they were pushed on this, Ishihara and his people uh, referred to things like this one on the left here. You can see that uh, by Matsuyama Seiji. Uh, that book is called um, My, uh, My Wife is a Grade Schooler. Yeah, the name doesn't sound great. Uh, but in fact, there's actually no uh, explicit sex in that book. It's just a kind of general um, kind of romantic, edgy, uh, you know, edgy comedy. But this was what they were thinking in their mind is the problem, which opens the door for almost anything. And two of the sort of things that actually were, were taken down by the new regulation were, for example, uh, Little Sister Paradise, which was taken down for not the reasons you expect, but because it didn't have the right labeling on it. And on the left, uh, on the far uh, right of the screen, you'll see uh, a manga here called Aiko no Machan, so Little Aiko's or Aiko's Little Ma, which is about a young girl's relationship with her developing body, including her vagina. This is written um, by a woman, uh, Yamamoto Arisa, and it's intended to be a kind of educational, but also a de-taboo, uh, uh, you know, making less taboo the discussion of women's anatomy and so on. But this was also deemed by a publisher to be too edgy, and so it was um, eventually published online instead of in paperback form. So for better or worse, we have a strange, vague target, and then all kinds of things being regulated in different ways to very little actual effect other than uh, crushing the domestic sales of paperbacks. So regulatory momentum is something I'd like us to keep in mind here, which is the kind of use of these new regulatory tools to really push uh, further than, than ever has been pushed before in the history of erotic comics. So even just looking at regulation, uh, the um, ordinances. So if you look at, um, for example, I 2017, in that one month alone, five manga titles were, de were designated unhealthy by the panel in Tokyo, uh, which is already a pretty high number, um, five in one month. But if you look at actually who was targeted by this, only one of them was the kind of thing that you would think of as you know, uh, adult comics for men. The others were actually uh, mostly for girls. So you had teen love, which is kind of racy, romantic stuff for young adults. Uh, you had actually five of, uh, three of them were boys love, the majority of, of, the, of those that were named. And so you're seeing here a kind of creep into expression for women, right? Being now the primary one to bear the brunt of the new regulatory momentum. Now you might be able to understand why Yamada Kumiko says to the UN, you're not helping. You're actually empowering these conservatives to stop us from producing our own works in public by and for ourselves. And that's the kind of story we, where we began with, which is this new kind of international uh, pressure being put onto Japan to increase its regulation beyond the already existing and accelerating uh, regulation. So the most obvious one here is the push on Japan to change its definition of child pornography to include manga and anime imagery. Um, other countries have made similar moves. I mentioned Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Uh, the Coroner's Act in the UK actually literally in many ways was revised, revised specifically to uh, target the income, uh, incoming wave of manga. But Japan has so far uh, resisted changing uh, the definition to include uh, manga anime images, even when they are of the new kind of wave of explicitly sexual works featuring explicitly underage characters, even then um, they have not defined this as abuse material, which has earned all kinds of international um, uh, scorn from organizations like the UN, the United, the United States, um, and so on, the Department of State, and so on and so forth. So, for example, calling Japan a kitty porn empire, which makes images like this of a man buying uh, anime manga style images into something to be concerned about rather than something that happens every day down the street from where I work. This then feeds back into the political discourse here. So that same image, that same story being debated on Japanese television, and you have members of the leading uh, liberal democratic party coming in talking about, yes, we do need to regulate uh, the comics and cartoons and the violence and happening animation, that they're emboldened by these international discussions to do things like Ishihara did in Tokyo.
and eventually all manga anime images, as we, as we saw in Australia with Senator Griff, all anime manga Im images become suspect. So for example, a very famous a report by CNN describing um, the concern that some car uh, these cartoons, quote, may be fueling the darkest desires of criminals. Notice the discourse here. Despite the low rate of, of crime and, and uh, abuse in Japan, statistically, they may be fueling those desires. They may be generating potential victims. They may be the province of potential criminals. Therefore, they should be regulated to preemptively stop this. Right? This is actually a mutation of the law in an interesting way beyond the initial um, purview of this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of law. We're seeing consequences, like in the United States, a man sentenced to six months for obscene manga, in this case, literally um, importing uh, erotic manga from Japan and being sentenced for um, possessing that material. The UK as well, uh, a successful prosecution of a man for the importation and possession of sexualized cartoon images from Japan, nine month sentence suspended for two years, which is then kind of that moment where we have all of this discourse about manga being a crime or not. Is manga kind of thing that is fueling those criminals, as the UN says, as CNN says, or is it just a kind of harmful fantasy? This is really where a book like Era Manga Studies, I think, is really interesting to kind of begin us thinking about well, what really is out there and what are the limits on what we want people to be uh, doing and seeing. And as you can see in the case of Japan, it's being debated right now. Right. So when Nagayama's book was published, that was when we we're having kind of these debates with people like Chiba Tetsuya, Nagai Go, Satonaka Machiko, Takemiya Keiko, famous artists coming out saying, I don't like some of this material, but on principle, we have to allow for freedom of expression in the cartoon world or all of our expression might be impacted by this. What's interesting about this is almost never at these public debates and hearings, almost never was there any representative of um, Japanese adult comics, era manga, the stuff that's in, introduced in um, Nagayama's book. So it's a kind of empty seat or a kind of, you know, absence of people who really ought to be at the table when we're discussing the limits and, uh, and freedom of imagination. And this leads us to a kind of interesting space where, in fact, all kinds of books, even books that ho hold images, like Nagayama's own uh, Kimi Rito's book, which has recently been translated as well, these books that have arrow in the title are actually being taken off of shelves and, and deemed unhealthy in some Japanese jurisdictions, which is again showing that not just the images, but some even the discourse about them can sometimes be caught up in this dragnet of anti-erotic um, discourse, which is what Nagayama calls the erotic barrier. And in many ways, the erotic barrier is, is growing um, around the world today. And essentially, the argument that he makes, and I would like to posed to you uh, tonight is we really need to see the material and think about it, uh, to think about it clearly and to know its place in the broader cultural landscape. Right? We need to actually see the images, talk about the images, share the images in a way that allows us to actually think thoroughly and clearly about what's going on here, rather than, as he says, turning away from the erotic, a kind of barrier against it, thinking the erotic is something dirty, deficient, dangerous, can completely outside in any sort of mainstream um, discussion or interest. So erotic comics in Japan is a kind of corrective to that, where it makes the structural invisibility, reverses it and makes all of the stuff, even the most extreme uh, of cases, makes it visible and understandable through a kind of historical, contextual, uh, and textual analysis of the works. And this is a kind of uh, counter to a more reactionary politics, which, you know, you're judging it without even actually seeing it in many cases, um, as we see with uh, Senator Griff, for example. And it's really significant for us, I think, because as Nagayama says, what's really at stake here is essentially a kind of effort to control not only desire, but thoughts, right? To be able to think about sex or the erotic is what's at stake. The barrier actually not only stops us from thinking about sex, but also privileges sex and makes it into something special and you know, untouchable, unthinkable. And in many ways, that's a kind of situation where we end up with a kind of puritanical politics, which he wants to, uh, in many ways, uh, um, turn us away from, right? 
And if you don't do this, essentially, you're ceding the moral ground and authority to people who are then going to make that judgment for you, right? They'll start with what's first obviously objectionable, and right? start with the most extreme stuff like lolicon, and then work their way back to eventually boys love or whatever else is a problem. And you can actually see this in the Japanese case. Um, certain libraries have taken uh, boys love uh, novels off of the shelves just because they had anonymous complaints that it's not healthy for children. Then a feminist group comes in and says, tell me why it's not healthy, and they put it back on the shelves. An arbitrary kind of reduction of the way we can see things. And at the height of, of, of sort of, you know, first as tragedy, then as farce, we have the government saying that even Winnie the Pooh might be objectionable because, you know, we see Winnie the Pooh attacking beehives and creating gen committing genocide against these animals that can't be good for children. So, I mean, again, you wouldn't believe it, but in the halls of government, we have people who are posing these kinds of, into my mind, into Nagayama's mind, that's the obscenity to, to be thinking that Winnie the Pooh is, 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 is itself a problematic text. And where this leads us, I think, is to really think about the moment we're in and where we, where we have the limits of our imagination and why, right? And I think it's important now with, you know, Art Spiegelman in, in the spotlight, but not just him, right? Other texts are already being, uh, other comics are being uh, targeted. And then beyond that, just books in general, right? Uh, we have reports like, for example, from last year, we have a 67% higher rate of people asking for library, uh, for, for libraries to remove books in the United States, right? An unprecedented 330 reports of book challenges, right? often of texts that are dealing with nothing more than Black people's experience or LGBTQ experience, which how is this harmful? Right? You see the kind of slide we're talking about here. And even uh, in a kind of really, uh, uh, again, uh, to my mind, uh, tragic uh, and dis disturbing turn, we've returned to book burning, right? And this again makes me quite concerned and it makes me think that this limit case with erotic manga might be a place for us really to challenge ourselves and to ask ourselves tough questions about what do we do and do not allow in our books, in our imagination, in our society. And I'll leave the last word here um, to Art Spiegelman, where he says uh, of the Tennessee vote to uh, remove uh, Mouse, it's part of a continuum and just a harbinger of things to come. The control of people's thoughts is essential to all of this. You strategically aim to, quote, limit what people can learn, what they can understand and think about. This is precisely Nagayama's point. This is precisely why he considers as one of the, the greatest values of a liberal society, a freedom of imagination or creation. So in Japanese, it's called sozo no jiu, sozo being both imagination and creation, right? And this particular politics and ethics is what he wants us to try, wants, wants to turn us towards in erotic comics in Japan. So I'll go ahead and leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, you can just put your name in the chat or unmute yourself. Try to do it in an orderly, non erotic fashion. <laughs> Can I get a comment? Yeah. There's an there, yes. There's a lot of people in the hall outside my apartment. It's kind of loud. So, um, but uh, it was interesting to think about. Um, like, I feel like sometimes different art forms will be judged like lurid or sensationalist, but it's often says less about the art form than the people looking at it. Like if you like like Gangster Rat, for example, or Ulysses or Lolita, I mean, like, I mean, even when I was watching this at first, my gut instinct was like, oh, you know, that's sort of, you know, this and that. But like, at the end of the day, like there really is a deep relationship between creativity and violence, right? Like po poetry, for example, there's a critic that I love named Alan Grossman who like, who talks about the relation between, between poetry and violence, like violence, poetry is a way you channel violence into creative avenues, right? 
but like, I, I thought your presentation was interesting because like, you know, oftentimes these, when people are censoring things, like in terms of the Tennessee business with Art Spiegelman, it always says more about them than the, the object they're trying to censor. It's like, it's their, it's their hangups, you know? Like, I feel like it's always their projected projections. At least it seems often to times to be that way. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know. But I think that, yeah, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Um, it says an awful lot about uh, I, the person who wants to regulate, right? So I, I would totally agree with this. I mean, so you look at what they rose up, they 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 raised up as as a problem in mouse, and there it is, right? Naked mouse. Oh, that's a problem, right? Despite the fact that this scene is not about eroticism whatsoever. If you think that scene is erotic, and I won't spoil it if you haven't read mouse, but that's that's a problem if you think that that particular scene or the use of dam is problematic if, if really that's where your mind is um that's a problem i would believe but then again in the back of their mind i think they have other problems with with mouse and so you know a friend of mine said something that was uh, quite right i think um and i'll, I'll quote him here uh, he said those aren't the panels that are problematic all of the panels were problematic they don't want any discussion of of the Holocaust. So I think that it, it also, the fact that you would pick up this book and then use the eroticism or the use of language as, as, a, as a, a, a cudgel to then try to take it out, says that you've picked up that book with a particular agenda in mind. And the same thing happened as Spiegelman pointed out, it happened in, in Russia as well, right? Where they used a, you can't show a swastika, you can't do that. But of course, Putin doesn't care about the use of a swastika, does he, right? He has a reason for wanting to you know, have mouse off, off the, the bookshelves. But as Spiegelman also points out, I think we have to think about what this does in, in a new kind of politics where we rally around each other. So when, that, when this happened in Russia, as it's also happening here in the United States, now mouse then in Russia phew, sold, sells out. Now phew, on the top of the charts again, bookstores are just giving it away in some cases. I mean, we're really seeing a resurgence of interest in this book as now kind of a, a counter to this creeping uh, conservative uh, crackdown against you know, thought in general. Any other questions? There's a question in the chat. Did you want to ask that out loud or Jeremy? Jeremy? Uh... Hi, I'm sorry. I can just uh, read my question if it's all right. Sure. Well, thank you, Patrick, for this great presentation. Uh, as uh, someone who studies um, video games, which sometimes uh, involve the same problems as some of you have mentioned uh, in the presentation, that is uh, eroticism and uh, materials like that. I, I was wondering if you have any recommendations for uh, researchers or students interested in studying this material from out of Japan, uh, so as to avoid some of the issues that you presented today. I know this might be difficult, but uh, maybe just thinking through the, 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 the question itself. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for that. Um, and I think you're right, you're right about um, this is not just being limited to comics. The comics, because they're often pushing those boundaries before, you know, animation or, or games, they're kind of like that canary in the coal mine in many ways. But yeah, it's happening all over. Um, and I would say that the limited access to it is really problematic, especially historical documents. So this is another reason why I think the histories like Nagayama's or even before this, Yonezawa Yoshihiro, um, these kinds of books really ought to be, I think, preserved, if not translated as we did with Nagayama as quickly as possible because the materials themselves have not been properly archived. So often they're disappearing. And on the other hand, in some jurisdictions, you actually can't even, even if you had them, you can't bring them back with you in physical form. So this happened to one of the late uh, Mark McClellan, who was on top of this, you know, from the you know, or mid 2000s. Um, he was, you know, Johnny on the spot. But one of his students uh, tried to bring back some of the material. Um, I think in his case, it was photographs from these early magazines. And no, right, I think just stopped at the border, right? So even though it's material being used for academic analysis, it was treated as if it were just some kind of trashy uh, pornographic work that would be fall afoul of, of the regulators. 
In another case that, uh, that uh, Mark McClellan uh, pointed out, one of his students was asked to, if you do work online, to present the websites of all of the offending uh, producers so that then the, uh, you know, the oversight, which has direct connections to the regulators and the government, they would know where the offensive material is. So essentially you have to tell your, your government where the, your informants are online. It's, it's scary stuff, right? And so I, I think that there is a problem here. I think the only way we can really begin to challenge it is to create connections across borders. There's already a lot of work being done here in Japan. And that work, I think, could be brought into productive dialogue outside of Japan, even without translation. We could have conventions, we could have um, discussions uh, online, offline, uh, in person. We could do this kind of work that would allow us to open that up, because not yet is it illegal in Japan. So if we had the support necessary here to archive, collate, make available, present this stuff, it would then allow it to be preserved here and that knowledge to be opened into the international dialogue without having to sort of smuggle it out in some cases. So I think we don't have to necessarily, we're gonna run up against the law in any case. And I think one of the solutions to this is to have a more integrated global discussion that brings Japan and the resources here to bear more fully. A question uh, from Forrest Greenwood. You wanna... Yeah, uh, Patrick, longtime fan of your work. Glad to finally cross paths. Um, so I was, I was wondering, um, given the emphasis on on regulation uh, that you've been talking about in this in this conversation, I was wondering if you had any thoughts or could kind of clarify for me what what your understanding of the situation is with. Um, manga artist uh, Ken Akamatsu taking a run, a stab at running for the Japanese diet this summer. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Akamatsu is an artist of uh, boys manga, uh, Love Hina, um, Negima, UQ Holder, um, which, which have quite a bit of this eroticized element to them. Um, and he was very open in publicly speaking up against the uh, Shintaro Ishihara's uh, laws against uh, non-existent youth. Yeah, um, thanks for bringing that up. So yes, I think um, Akamatsu is a great example of someone who started off as just a, um, a normal artist who even his work might not even fall afoul of regulators, but on principle, he has began, he, he started some years ago to be a kind of public face of the debate and to offer himself as an example of, uh, of the limits and so on. And I think because he's such a beloved artist, um, he might have a, a good, he might be a good sort of bridge between some of the more subcultural stuff, the more offensive stuff and some of the more mainstream you know, concerned citizens, politicians in other um, group, including the LDP, by the way. I mean, you, you have, of course, in, in the conservative uh, ruling party, you do have uh, some people who are very pro-regulation, uh, but you also have a lot of what probably in the States we call libertarians who, who want um, freedom of expression. And so I think he could find, um, he could find common cause with them. And that has been occurring at a small level so there is, he wouldn't be the first. Um, Yamada Taro, yes, Yamada Taro has been in, uh, in the diet for some years. I think he was, uh, he lost his election in the last round or he might be back now, but he made his, um, his number one issue of uh, freedom of expression. And he would kind of go to the comp market and talk, do these roadside speeches. At the same time, he would bring those concerns directly to, um, to the prime minister. So he actually asked during, if you remember the TT, uh, TPP debates about the regulation of copyright, he's the guy who literally asked uh, the prime minister, um, so what about, what about fanzines? And the prime minister had to go to, because you have to answer, had to go to the microphone and said, the fanzines will be safe. So there's, I think there are politicians like that who are kind of making it a serious part of their platform. Um, kind of like with the Pirate Party and, and so on, who are actually taking the single issue and really making it an important part of the discussion. Now, whether or not um, Akamatsu 
could get elected, I'm not sure. Because unlike you know, the popularity contest that we have in, a lot, in, in some countries like the United States, um, you have to have a lot of political clout to get the backing you would need. Um, and I'm not sure that he's connected that way. So it would be, in, it'll be interesting to see if he can sort of just run a very public campaign that rallies people to him. Um, but I think it's 50-50, we'll see. I mean, even if he doesn't make it, there are other politicians at you know, the ward level, the state, uh, the, 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 the prefectural level, and of course the national level who are already kind of pushing this direction. And so it wouldn't be a make or break moment even if he loses, but it would be nice to have another you know, uh, strong voice and someone who's also very familiar um, to a lot of people out there speaking. I see um, Michael Dooley has a clarification about the uh, situation in Tennessee. I don't know if you want to explain that or if you read the uh, transcript of that meeting, that school board meeting, it just seems like a uh, committee that came to a dead end. They could, no one had a suggestion for another book. It was a, uh, so, I mean, it's hard to say whether they were all trying to suppress discussion of the Holocaust, but I guess- Yeah, you they're not, claiming, right? yeah, they're, they're claiming to be looking for another book to replace yeah. uh, Mouse, but uh, yeah, it was a unit on the Holocaust that they wanted to bring Mouse in, which made the uh, objection to the Spiegel, Spiegelman's book even more absurd. So, but uh, yeah, it was it was the eighth grade um, at the at the school uh, that was specifically uh, teaching the Holocaust. So I just wanted to uh, clear that up. But not really. No, it get, yeah, that, that story in in the mainstream media is getting completely confused into an issue of naked mite drawings of naked mice. There's not. There's nothing like that went yeah. on in that discussion. It was an image of our yeah. mother naked, but not mice. And anyway, yeah, uh, they, yeah, little yeah. little uh, drawing of her uh, naked after committing suicide, and yeah. uh, you know they're claiming that well, you know that, <laughs> that 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 it's you know bad enough that it's naked that she's naked, but it's also going to you know encourage her students to kill themselves. You know that that kind of nonsense. The whole thing's yeah. a farce. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Yeah, I had a question. All. You mentioned that that Crumb's explicit comics never moved into the mainstream in the way that those kinds of things happened in Japan. And, um, and uh, as part of sort of a uh, half generation later than uh, Crumb, and I remember when, when Art Spiegelman was putting together Raw magazine, he once commented, this is awfully, uh, you know, there's no explicit material here. It's all very chaste. And, and I, I mean, I think um, cartoonists who were trying to um, approach comics as um, from a literary point of view, thought it was a dead end. I mean, there's a long tradition of, you know, Tijuana Bibles and things like that in comics in America. And, and I don't know if it's just, it's such a deeply puritanical culture that we have other ways of um, channeling eroticism, not in explicit images of bodies or genitalia. So you can make an erotic comic about, you know, um, buses or trains. So, uh, I did, so did you? Is that is so? What is it about Japan that made this become a major mass market thing? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think you're absolutely right that anything can be erotic. That's one of the things that I think people like Tezuka have taught us very well. And if you've been to the comic market, 
there are there are in fact fanzines that are focusing on eroticized trains right, and, and right. what have you uh both both in the eroticization of the actual vehicle and like the timetables and all of this kind of fetishistic development of, of information yeah, I mean, and that's, photographs I mean, and all of that yeah but at the same time literally people who are anthropomorphizing the trains and then saying as these two trains are crossing lines at this intersection that's their relationship right and let's imagine it so i think what's what's interesting isn't that there's other outlets for eroticism but that this one isn't off the table so you say it's a dead end uh, I, well I it seemed you... at least for the people after crumb it seemed like well wh where is this i mean there are there were other either other ways to talk about um passions uh, and yeah, that might be part, just part of a Puritan tradition that we find other ways to do it. But I don't think they're even anthropomorphized. I think it's more to do with, you know, Marx's ex uh, understanding of fetishistic commodity objects becoming fetishes to people. And you don't need people are out of the picture at that point. <laughs> Human beings are just out of the picture. So they're not, I never thought of these things as, uh, anthropomorphized in any literal way like that no. just um transferring those feelings to inanimate mm. objects or you know other situations or just it being an under you know a subtext to the story and it nothing mm. it doesn't have to be explicit you can uh, but i don't know but yeah it's a you know a similar thing went on i, I was just reading about a kabuki theater there was a whole movement to kind of sanitize kabuki theater which was much more uh rough dealt in all kinds of rough situations i forget when that was in the late um 1800s or mid yeah i forget the dates but there's a whole history of this happening in theater in japan um trying to uh make it more presentable as a more uh, something that um elite parts of the society could attend so i don't know but anyway there were uh comics i mean the reason mouse was rejected by every major publisher in new york just because it was a con the idea of talking about um uh the holocaust in the form of a comic strip was con was considered unthinkable to most uh, mm -hmm. publishers so not even the way it why? was done because why oh because of yeah, the like, the um connotations of comics that they're making fun. they're not serious or they're stupid or they're disrespectful in some way i i mean it goes back to uh the um that whole uh wortham period there was a real um and and it goes back to the sa same kind of thing happened with pulp magazines in the uh, 19th century if a book was the minute a book had an illustrated cover it was seen as being detrimental to young readers if it didn't have an illustrated cover or illustrations it was okay and there were all these test cases and that's pure separating of the mind from the body you know this kind of puritanical idea you, that you can do that so uh it goes back beyond before comics to, and it, you know. it, it seems like almost an issue about aesthetics and ethics um like i, I oh sorry yeah oh i mean like, anyway it's yeah it's yeah. a it's a long history but it's interesting how it plays out in other countries and in other cultures uh that's just the way it played out i think you're absolutely right though, about thinking about other cultures other places other times but then also the, the, the both of you andrew and then ben you're both sort of touching on this idea of images and i think you're right um there's a wonderful anthropologist at chicago william mazzarella whose work is on india uh, and on regulatory regimes in Indian advertisement and then also Bollywood. And what Mazzarella points out is that um, what the regulators are saying often 
isn't that what we're usually, it's not the actual content of the image. It's the relationship between the viewer and the screen. So for example, when they would tell him, we have to, you know, we can't have a kissing scene in a Bollywood film because those front row benchers are gonna be hooting and hollering and gonna go crazy, right? And they're gonna go out in the street, right? And so it actually didn't matter what it was, you know, it could be a kiss or a, a touch or anything, but this kind of unbounded potential for the image to move them. And so the relationship, what, what, what was the problem? And what Mozzarella points out is that there's a, it's a two-part process because I'm not moved this way. He calls this the enunciator's exception. I'm not moved this way, but someone will be. And this is part two. You project onto another population that's at risk of being moved in a negative way, right? So in the case of India, it's low-class men who are going to be moved to, you know, some kind of horrendous action by seeing that on the screen, right? They're, they're dangerously open to the affect of the moving image, right? This was the same thing that they said about pornography in the United States, right? The raincoat brigade. You're going to go to the theater and then you're going to get all worked up. And these men are going to go out there and they're going to do some, some kind of violence, right? So the relationship is significant. And often I think when we, when we talk about the written word, it's, well, no, it's, it's intellectual and receded. We're going to read the book, right? Not an image that's going to open us up and move us in a way that we're out of control, right? So I think the relationship with images is central to the regulation of, of bodies. Right. Um, can I say one more thing? Am I talking too much? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think Ben seemed to raise a really good point, which is that like, the, I love Harold Bloom is a big guide for me. Harold Bloom was like one of the greatest literary critics of the end of the 20th century. The last, and he talked, he always used a phrase called difficult pleasures. Meaning like, I mean, I remember too, as a kid seeing, you know, playboys in my friend's house and it was like a revelation, right? But, but, but then like, you know, later on when I read like Ashbery or Stevens, it was like sort of I think it was analogous to how Ben described the sort of erotics of trains, right? It was sort of like a difficult pleasure. Um, and I think in, in the context of this work, it seems like it's maybe ethically transgressive, but aesthetically, I mean, I much prefer to read literary comics like Ben's work or Liana Fink's or Gabrielle Bell, who I think is like astonishing. Um, and in those works, I think, if you kind of call them literary comics, they're literary because they're aesthetically powerful. Um, they, they have ethical concerns, but if they were only ethical, I mean, you can read an old dusty religious treatise on ethics and be bored to death, right? I mean, what makes it, what makes them like what makes the work the work is the aesthetics of it um even though that yeah so so yeah so i mean so i feel like in, in this particular presentation it seemed like i mean correct me if i'm wrong but it seemed like your interest was that they're, they're sort of aesthetically subversive and like taboo shattering but it's ethically i mean but aesthetically i mean like i i, I don't i didn't personally i didn't find them to be like I mean, even Crumb's work, I think, is sort of, there's something more to it. I mean, this seemed like more, I mean, the stuff's written mostly for adolescents, isn't it? So, I mean, it's just something to think about, sort of the idea of difficult pleasures, right? Like, mm -hmm. difficult pleasures. Um, yeah. Right. I, I see where you're coming from. And I would just make two points of clarification about what, about erotic comics in Japan. Um, not just for adolescents. Um, in fact, a lot of, especially when you're talking about historically like the third wave Gekiga movement, our third rate Gekiga movement um, with people like Ishi Takashi and others, um, this was as challenging in terms of text as, as anything else. I think 
it's definitely, there's another one, Star of David, which goes into some quite dark territory. And it's this kind of run for the mill in many ways. They always are pushing far beyond what you would expect would be possible in a particular. Let me just put the other thing out. One thing that erotic comics do, and Nagayama is quite clear about this, is they don't stop with the erotic, even though they take you to that dark place. So for example, imagine if Alison Bechdel, and I agree, literary comics are fantastic, right? And she's probably one of the greatest examples of this in recent years. Take Fun Home, yeah, all right. Now, what? imagine what? What if you actually had to walk through the, in, the insinuated relationships or even her imaginary relationships with people around her, the father, you had to go through those and they were drawn to be erotic in a way that appeals to you, not in a condescending way. It's erotic. You can actually masturbate to it if you like. And you're not actually stopping with the, the literary content. Now that puts you in a really tough place. So you have people who read these comics who say these amazing things like, I've never had a cry wank before, right? But like, think about that. Like things we don't imagine to be together are. And the way you feel about that and the places you're taken into that sense, Nagayama himself talks about reading some of these comics and being confronted with the self who takes pleasure in that horrific event that you're seeing, right? Now that is a challenge, right? It's a challenge to see that darkness and to walk through it and to walk to be er erotically, er to be aroused by it as you're doing it, right? And to see the self aroused by it, to see the others aroused by it and to have to deal with that openly, publicly with others. For him, that's an ethical thing to face it, to face yourself in the comic openly and with others. That for him is the kind of society that we should be building where we don't hide it and you know that's not a, it's not about me that guy over there as mozzarella says that guy takes pleasure in it but but not me no 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 I'm, I'm just i'm just here for the story right you're not allowed to to bow out that way and so it has a unique challenge in that it appeals to the body which is exactly what we're not supposed to do especially with some of these scenarios right Else. Well, that's definitely not a reason to ban <laughs> comics because you don't think, you know, they're aesthetically up to your level of taste. I mean, I, that's, that's not a good criteria for doing that. That's for sure. So uh, that's what's being implied somewhere or by something. Um, so anyway. Any other questions or comments? I think manga are some of the biggest selling comics in America too now, right? I don't forget the statistics, but I think they sort of take a big chunk of the market for people who buy comics. So yeah. Translations, thing. right? Translations, right? So, Last year, uh, I think the numbers were, were, were quite astounding I think not for 2021 but for 2020 it's like something like the top uh i think seven out of the top 10 uh best earning uh graphic novels in the united states or even i think beyond just graphic novels like it was children's literature seven of the top 10 were um translations of japanese manga so yeah i mean in for better or worse it is part of our mainstream now and kids are reading it and they're being exposed to this they're debating it they're aware of it they're drawing their own comics Right. So understanding a little bit more about, you know, the, that culture and especially the way in which eroticism is baked into it, I think, in an open way would be helpful for all of us, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, half of my students at Parsons are from uh, the East, from China or Japan or Korea. And, you know, manga, they grew up on a completely different diet of comics than I did. And um, it's always a revelation to see what kinds of stories they think, and also what kind of stylistic uh, 
um, possibilities they're open to that would never occur to me as being, you know, consistent in some Western art framework. So uh, it's definitely something to uh, that we have to uh, make the most of. Okay, and if there are no other questions, I can thank you for that really in-depth. like on Twitter today, oh. like someone was like, someone from a web a publisher named Domino's Books was like, he was like, like the, I don't, I'm new to this sort of comics world, the graphic novel world, but in my background is literature. Um, but there's like weird, the dynamics is so is very vexed. It seems like in the in the comics and graphic novels world, where like, for example, in the tweet today on Twitter, a publisher of of comics and probably cartoons or graphic novels, he was like, he, he was like early Chris Ware, and you know he named some other you know examples. He's like, that's not literature. He's like, you know, it's sort of like literature is the pretentious, you know, professors and comics are the, you know, this and that. But like, I also don't like pretentious people, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like the work being done by particular graphic novelists like Ben or, I mean, I'm not trying to flatter you too much, Ben, but like, or Liana or Gabrielle, um, a few other people, Chris Ware, like, it's just as strong as any fiction or short stories being written today. So it seems unfair to not consider it aesthetically as literature. Mm -hmm. And and it, not just, this isn't like, I mean, this was this was a guy who's publishing comics. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's like this sort of like separatist mindset where it's like, I mean, I can understand why people like, there's a guy, Mike Porcelino, he's been like self-publishing for a long time. Like I can understand why they'd be like, this is ours. That makes sense to me, but like, I mean, Whit Walt Women self-published, right? Um, ARM and self-published. I mean, like, it's the same spirit. It's the spirit of like taking art in new directions, and like George Harriman, like he was like a, a, a genius. I mean, he was, how how original can you probably be? In, in, in a original in a very unique way. Yeah, I don't think the argument whether you can make a successful work of a certain kind in comics is too many people have that argument, I think. But anyway, the fact is that Crum is um, in a large part canceled from by part of the culture. I mean, he, he couldn't attend some festival because of people's um, reaction to his work. And uh, I think that, those are the the problems when uh, when you can't even put the work out there for some reason. Whether who's going to be able to even judge it if you can't put it out there, mm -hmm. or even enjoy it, or be horrified by it, whatever your reaction is. But that's sort of where we are today. They, you know, um, the example you. Um, you know, if you mentioned him as the example of where one direction in, in um, explicit eroticism comics could have gone in America. That's not, mm -hmm. it's really hard for that to exist now in certain mm -hmm. circles. I mean, I don't, I don't really know how, how widespread that feeling is, but, but I think that's a, bad, that's a dangerous place to go. Right. And I'm glad that you're sort of thinking about what, what might have been, because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, think about what would have happened if that irreverence, that kind of flirting with this violent interiority and this, you know, sexual fantasy, fantasies that he had, if this had gone into a kind of tradition in a way and been allowed to, to blossom. And again, think about the kind of freedom and the the the, the ability that's the, the 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 rope that's given to people to do what they'd like to do in comics and their imagination 
in this context, I mean, it's hard, you can't, I mean, the idea of canceling a manga artist in Japan is, doesn't exist. I mean, you could, you could arrest one when they break the law, but you can't cancel them and you can do whatever you want. You, there's consequences, of course, you might alienate readers, you might get taken off shelves or whatever, but the idea that there would be a limit to what you can think and draw and share that's what's been fought for so hard. And I think that it's interesting to think like if you had that kind of irreverence and that kind of sexuality um, existing today, what would happen? And I can only think, cause you know, Crumb was always about triggering people as is Eromanga, by the way, you're triggering people, right? And so you, now you're not supposed to do that. So I, there's a way that I think it's, it's unthinkable for him to exist now. Right. And they certainly, if you've plucked him out of the 1970s and dropped him into the present, it would take about a week before he becomes persona non grata. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, no, this, these, these um, situations with him not being able to attend a uh, festival that happened recently. So, yeah, it's not an, ex you don't have to do the experiment in that sense. He felt. He felt threatened at this event. The idea of the reaction was so negative to him. But um, so uh, anyway, I think we can. It's a long. It's an open. It's an unended situation. It's an ongoing situation, and uh, it's great that to hear how it's being handled in Japan. But that's all I can say, I guess. Like even Thank poetry you. in this country, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, thanks. So thank you, Patrick. And- uh, Yeah, my pleasure. Be in touch. Maybe if any new, new uh, things happen in Japan, it'd be great to hear about where this is all going. I mean, I think in, in, if you read about um, kind of uh, people wanting to change human relationships, you know, like the Bolshevik experiment, I mean, they said you can't force it on people. I mean, that's sort of what they ended up doing maybe under Stalin, but the idea originally was, well, first you change you know, at least the economic situation between people, and then maybe their interests would change the way they relate to one another. So maybe um, we can think about that. That's a possibility. Maybe people are not. Think. And maybe in, in the West, I mean, there's so much violence in the culture that we don't need it in comics. We put the news on. I mean, it's all about yeah threatening wars and nuclear wars with people. I mean, what, what, what more um, erotic violence do you need than yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, maybe that's where our eroticism is, headshot, yeah. headshot. <laughs> I think that's where it's all gone. Yeah, into uh, the military industrial complex. Must be very erotic for people. Anyway, so. Yeah, maybe because Japan, they, they're not allowed still to have an army? Or is that finished, that rule? Uh, they... It depends on what you mean, what you mean by an army. There is an army, it's just not defined as such. It's the, oh, okay. Okay. the, the, the self-defense the self -defense force. force, but they, yeah, maybe they, can't, that's why they can't yet deploy. They can't yet deploy. But but yeah. to speak to our, the work should speak to our hearts more than it speaks to our sexual fantasies. Don't you think? Like, if it speaks yeah. to your heart, then you feel nourished and you feel. Yeah, you know, I, like I think that they're all, nobody's debating that there are different purposes for making comics. They serve different purposes, you know. Yeah. Some should be just pure pornography and some should be, you know, speaking more on some other levels of uh, to your interest in language or, but, um, but maybe that explains it partly after the war that there was no outlet in, in the government sanctioned violence anymore. And it all could be played out 
interpersonally in some way, or it needed to be. I don't know. Is anybody, is that a theory people have? Yeah, it has been floated by a couple, uh, a couple of scholars of Japan that this sort of idea that some of that content or some of that experience might be filtered into popular culture more generally. As an example of this, the pop artist Murakami Takashi, um, who opened in New York some years ago, uh, you recall he had this idea that um, you know this the repetition of the explosion that you see in Japanese animation, for example, is where that outlet for a kind of the little boy syndrome he calls it the the violence done during the war gets then projected into popular culture often in a fun or terrifying way, but it's dealt with not in public discourse, but it's dealt with in the sphere of comics, cartoons, and related media and material. And so I think he's probably the most, um, the most clear um, advocate of it, but others, um, I mentioned Susan Napier, whose book was, was picked up in Ohio. She has a similar idea, Roland Kelts and others have talked about this. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely an idea um, to think about that, you know, maybe comics being the premier outlet for all of this suppressed stuff to come out, right, in public and to be shared, right? Right. Yeah. Some kind of right mass catharsis. But anyway, that was. We'll think about it. And there's a um, a, a talk coming up in a few weeks about these the um, origins of um, how American comics filtered back into Japan, but that's before the war, you know, in the twenties and things, that whole influence there. Um, so we'll, that's coming up in a few weeks. So f again, thank you, Patrick, and uh, good luck with your work. Yeah, thank you for inviting yes, me, it's I been great. I mean, it's fantastic conversation. I mean, it's, it's seldom, I think, that I get to hear so many different perspectives on, you know, from outside of, you know, the, 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 the circle of scholars here working on, on this and related topics. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that, good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. See you next week.